Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello. Where are the dinosaurs gone? Unfortunately, you're now uh, just normal people again. So, Welcome back, everyone. Have you had a good time at Angular Connect so far? Yeah. I think That's you can do better than that. not bad for a Tuesday Come morning. On. It's the morning. I'm sure you can be louder than that. Let's try again. Have you had a good time at Angular Connect so far? Hey. <laughs> much better. Well done. OK. Welcome back. We've had a really good day uh, yesterday, and we've got so much fantastic content to keep piling on to you today. So let's start off with some pictures from yesterday. So this was in our community lunch. Uh, we're going to tweet later about how you can get involved if you'd like to. Um, and yes, that was They're us. They're the dinosaurs. Our dinosaurs. That's us. Um, you might they, not recognize us. Yeah, you can actually still try them on if you'd like to at the t-shirt stand later. Um, this is one of our panels and our famous Angular Ales that you hopefully had tried out. And. We got some really great tweets yesterday, and we've got a few prizes to give away. So, um, click. thank you. Um, we really like this tweet with our dinosaur costumes. So, um, Shannon, uh, come on up, and you can grab your prize at the front. Well done, Shannon. If you're here, come on up. Hey. <laughs> We thought this one from Mark was really, really cute as well. It's nice to see our T-shirts being used. So it's Mark, come on up to the front and grab your prize. It's important to have uh, Angular developers starting young. I think it's very good. And it's also really lovely to see tweets about our community. So Manuel, come on up and grab your prize. Well done. Here he is. <laughs> So don't forget to keep tweeting throughout the day. We've got plenty more prizes to come. It, use the hashtag Angular Connect. And there's even a free ticket to next year's Angular Connect available for the best tweet. So it's definitely worth having a go. So code of conduct. Uh, we did well yesterday, so lo let's keep that up. Um, this is just a reminder of the details if you do need to get in contact with us. Don't forget that we've got other things going on other than content. Get over to the games room. Uh, the mindfulness sessions start at 10.20 this morning. So if you'd like to go and take part, then get over there. And uh, in case you weren't here yesterday, or you just forgot to connect to the Wi-Fi, you can still find the Wi-Fi code on your badge. So we've got live captioning again, as you can see. Thank you very much to our stenographers, white mm. coat captioning. <laughs> Um, and thank you again for them, yep. And don't forget, of course, our fantastic sponsors. Who's been out and been visiting the sponsors in the halls? I've been really enjoying going and chatting to them all. Um, do keep going and seeing them. The coffee machine is still running. You can see the die casts being modeled uh, on the video there. It's really cool. So, on to the keynote. We've um, managed to pull Alex out deep from the weeds of Ivy for a little while to come and talk to us today. Um, I don't know about you, but find hearing Igor talk about the impact of Ivy on the size of apps yesterday, I think was really, really interesting. So I'm absolutely thrilled to have Alex here to come and talk about it. So please put your hands together and give a very warm welcome to the wonderful Alex Rickaber. Alex Rickaber! <laughs> All right, now I get to see if I can type my password under pressure. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Angular Connect Day 2. I'm so excited to be here. Um, this is one of my favorite Angular events of the year. I love coming to it. Coming to this conference feels like going to an Angular family reunion. I just see so many familiar faces. People come up to me, tell me, oh, I know, I remember you from last year. We talked about this or that. I love interacting with our community here. And I'm really excited to be here to tell you all about Ivy. So um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Alex Rickabaugh. Uh, I'm an engineer on the Angular core team. And I've been on the core team actually about as long as I've been coming to this conference, like three and a half, almost four years now. Um, I've worked on a few things in my time on core. Um, I worked on HTTP client, the Angular common HTTP library. I worked on our service worker as part of our progressive web apps effort. And most recently, I'm working on uh, maintaining the Angular compiler and getting it ready for Ivy. So before we get started, to really understand what Ivy is, you kind of have to have a, a good mental model of how Angular works under the hood. 
Um, many of you kind of already know this, so in that case, it'll be a refresher. Uh, but you can think of the Angular part of your application as being composed of two parts. The first part is the code that we generate when you run NGC, our AOT compiler, against your templates. You may have encountered that code before in the form of ng factory files. And the second part is the code in Angular itself that you import from core and platform browser that supports your compiled templates at runtime. And we call that part the runtime. And so these two together form what we call the Angular render. Now, on the Angular team, we get a lot of feedback from you, our users, um, through a variety of channels. You file GitHub issues, bugs, feature requests. Uh, you talk to our developer relations team, maybe directly through your company, or you, know, you fill out our developer survey uh, that we had recently. And a lot of this feedback is specific. You know, This doesn't work. This could be better. But there are some general themes there. You want Angular to be simpler. You want it to be easier to use and pick up and understand. You want builds to be faster. You want bundles to be smaller. And you want more advanced features like higher order components. And so we've continued to work on the framework and optimize it across all of these dimensions. But as we're doing this, we started running into some limitations. Our current rendering architecture, which is known as the View Engine, um, just kind of wasn't getting us where we wanted to be. And so it was time for a new approach. And Angular Ivy is that new approach. At high level, Angular Ivy is a new backend for our compiler, coupled with a new runtime. And together, they replace the view engine in your Angular applications. And we're doing this, it's a substantial refactoring of how Angular works internally. But just like when we released view engine in Angular 4.0, it's going to be backwards compatible with existing Angular applications. For the vast majority of our users, you'll turn Ivy on, and your application will be better. And that's all really you'll have to notice. So Ivy has a, a few different design goals, but it has one overarching theme. And the overarching theme is that it's a simplification of how Angular works internally. With Ivy, we've been able to remove a lot of complexity from the framework, from how we compile applications to how we package and bundle and ship libraries on NPM to how those parts link together and depend on each other at runtime. And simplification is always a good goal to have in and of itself, not just because it makes things simpler, but also because you get a lot of benefits from it that you may not even anticipate when you start such an effort. And we've definitely noticed that with Ivy. So in addition to making Angular simpler, um, both to use and to understand, we had a number of other goals that we set for ourselves when we started designing this thing. I specifically want to focus on three of them. And the first one is optimizability. We wanted to make Angular code, both the code that we generate for your templates and the code in our runtime, more optimizable. JavaScript tooling has actually come a long way since we released Angular 2.0. And we want to take advantage of the best tools the ecosystem has to offer. And next, we wanted Angular compilation to be incremental. And this brings two benefits. It makes compilation faster, but it also reduces the burden on libraries to ship complex metadata to NPM for their dependent dependents to use. And finally, while we're doing this, we wanted to make sure that Ivy would give us a flexible technical foundation to build all of the Angular features that you are all requesting. So we're going to dive into all of these goals and see how the Ivy design meets them. And I'm going to start doing that by talking a little bit about where we're coming from. To get the best perspective on Ivy, we need to understand how Angular has worked in the past. And so we're going to look at the two previous rendering architectures, the template compiler from Angular 2.0 and the view engine that replaced it in 4.0 and is still in use today. And we're going to do that by examining this fairly simple template and see how it gets compiled from template compiler to view engine to Ivy. And this template is a little more complex than just Hello World. Uh, we've got a couple elements. We have title being interpolated. We have a child component with an ngif. This is a pretty good example of a typical Angular application using you know, a few of our more common features. So the first one we're going to look at is the template compiler from Angular 2. 
2.0 was released in September, just about two years ago and change. Um, I honestly can't believe it's been that long. Um, it feels like it was just yesterday. We had you know, four major versions now. Um, back then, I was working on platform bootstrapping APIs, things like how the application ref gets created under the hood when you call platform browser. Um, and I remember going to team meetings and tech talks and listening to Tobias tell us all about his new AOT compiler and some of the things that it could do. And I never imagined that I would be up here talking to all of you two years later about how I'm helping build the same things for Ivy. So the template compiler in Angular 2 compiled HTML templates into generated JavaScript code to both render and change detect them at runtime. And so I went on NPM, and I installed Angular 2.0.0. You can still find it there. Um, I wonder if anyone's actually still using it. But I built this simple app with it using my example template. And I dug around in the ng factory file and pulled out this code. And this is the code that renders that template in template compiler. Um, and it's kind of dense and hard to, to kind of look at, but um, you can kind of get a general idea of what's going on. On the left-hand side here, we have a lot of properties on the class that we're assigning DOM elements to. And this is so we can update them or delete them later. And on the right-hand side, you see calls to our render to do things like create elements and create text nodes. We're also creating the ngif here towards the bottom, as well as a couple other Angular classes like view container ref and template ref. Uh, and this code is actually really efficient. We did a lot of research at the time to prove that this is one of the fastest ways to create DOM structure in the browser. Um, and our benchmarks have backed that up. But something happened. As more and more developers started using Angular and building bigger and bigger applications with it, um, we started getting feedback that these generated templates were just too verbose. They were adding too many bytes, too much overhead to bundles. And so we needed to come up with a different approach that would allow us to represent templates with less overhead. And so for Angular 4.0, we went back to the drawing board and came up with the view engine. The view engine, unlike the template compiler, represents templates not as an imperative list of rendering operations, but as a data structure. And there's a runtime component which traverses the data structure to either create DOM nodes or execute change detection. And by doing that, we optimized our template size and managed not to sacrifice performance during rendering. So here's what a view engine template looks like. It's much smaller. It's also harder to understand because there's a lot more kind of magic numbers and nulls running around. Um, but we can still get the general idea. We have a div and a span here. You can imagine the next line is a text node. And we still have our ngif being created to control that child component. So Ivy is along the same vein. It's a replacement renderer for Angular. And it has the same fundamental moving parts. It has a template compiler, which translates HTML templates to code, and has a runtime, which supports rendering and change detection in the browser. And it's a replacement for the view engine in that the exact same applications can compile on Ivy as did before. And the Ivy team is actually hard at work validating that compatibility. We have hundreds and hundreds of Angular applications at Google, and we're in the process of testing Ivy out with them and running their thousands of tests and fixing any instances that we find where Ivy's behavior is different from the view engine before it. And so by the time Ivy is released, it will be validated by all of these tests at Google, not just our own internal test suite. So let's dig deeper. Let's take a closer look at how Ivy actually works under the hood and how it achieves all of our goals. So the, the central kind of design idea in Ivy is that Angular decorators, like at component and at directive, get compiled to static fields on the types that are decorated. So at component becomes at ng component def static field. At directive becomes ng directive def, injectable, injectable def, and so on. And by doing this, we've actually taken the code that used to be produced in separate ng factory files, and we've moved it into the component and directive classes themselves. So here's what this looks like in practice. On the left here is our root component with our example template. And on the right is the output of what NGC generates in Ivy mode today. 
this at component annotation has actually become an ng component def static field. You can think of it as the, the component, the de decorator at component actually has an effect, which is to patch a static field onto the class. And this static field contains metadata that tells the IV runtime important information about this component. Things like what are its selector, and the fact that it uses two directives here, the child component and ngif. It also has at the bottom a template function, which is responsible for doing the same things as before, rendering the template to DOM, and then running change detection. And so here's what the IV template function looks like. And right away, you'll notice a few things. It's also pretty short. Um, unlike the view engine, it contains imperative calls, actually more like the original template compiler did. Uh, and these imperative calls are doing things like creating div and span elements, setting up the child template with its ngif. Um, the other thing you'll notice is that I've actually included the change detection code here as well. Um, I couldn't fit it on the slides for the other ones, but for this one, the first if block renders the template the first time the component is inserted into the DOM, and the second if block runs change detection. So it's checking two bindings here. The first is our interpolation for title, and the second is the condition for the ng if. Instead of a single template interpreter at runtime, like we had in View Engine, in Ivy, we've broken that runtime up into a set of individual rendering functions that we call the Ivy instruction set. It's almost like an assembly language for Angular templates. And a template gets compiled to two sequences of these instructions, one sequence to create it and insert it, and the other sequence to run change detection. The instruction set is comprehensive. It covers not only things like um, DOM creation and data binding, it covers things like internationalization, um, styling, pipes, and SVG. So as an example, let's look at how DI works under the IV instruction set. So here's an example service class. This is an authentication guard for the router. Um, it's going to check permissions on you know, the, the current route when the user navigates to it. And it's injecting three different things. We're injecting the router. We're injecting the HTTP client, and we're also injecting some config object using add inject. And you can imagine our implementation of this guard might have logic like this. First, we check the config to see what permissions are required for the current URL. Um, then we use HTTP client to make a call to see if the user actually has those permissions. And finally, if they don't, we use the router to navigate them away. So what Ivy is going to do is it's going to take this add injectable and compile it to an ng injectable def field. And that looks like this. This ng injectable def has a factory function associated with it. And the factory function is responsible for actually creating the instances of this guard. And it works through two steps. One, for every dependency that needs to be injected, the factory function will call the IV inject instruction. It'll give the inject instruction the token and it gets back an instance of the dependency. And once those instances have been created, all the factory function has to do is call the constructor like normal. And I actually found this to be interesting because this pattern is exactly how I imagine dependency injection in my head. Right? You're asking some injector to give you instances of the dependencies, and then you're just calling the constructor with those instances. Right? That's nice and simple. And another thing I'd like to point out about this is if the auth guard actually had no dependencies, right, if everything were hard-coded in its logic, then it wouldn't actually need to call the inject instruction. Our factory function would just be calling new auth guard, open parenthesis, close parenthesis. And that's not an accident, as we'll see later. So let's talk about the benefits before um, and the goals that I, we had for Ivy. There are three of them that I mentioned I was going to cover optimizability, incrementality, and flexibility. And optimizability is one of the more important ones. Ivy lets us leverage a growing ecosystem of JavaScript tools that optimize code. And in particular, I wanted to focus on an optimization called tree shaking. Um, tree shaking is what's going to take us to a model in Angular where if you don't use a feature in your application, 
you don't pay the cost of the bytes to support it at runtime. Tree shaking is one of those terms that gets thrown around a lot um, without really being very explicitly defined. So I'm going to attempt to do that here. And it also doesn't help that people call it by lots of different names. Um, you may have heard it referred to as dead code elimination. Other people say, no, it's called live code inclusion. They all refer to the same fundamental optimization, which is that looking at an application bundle, the optimizer attempts to prove that certain code is not used at runtime. And if it can do that, it can remove that code from the bundle and make it smaller. And the first time I heard about this, I had a little thought in the back of my head. It was like, well, where is that unused code coming from? As an application developer, I don't have time to write code that I'm not going to actually use in my application, right? I'm, I don't have time to be that inefficient. I have too much work to do. Um, but as it turns out, there is a lot of code that ends up in bundles that doesn't necessarily belong there. And that's because we import things from libraries. And libraries are great, right? The material library has a ton of components that you can pick and choose from for your application. But it's very unlikely that you're going to use all of them. Right? There's way too many for that. Your UI would be crazy. Um, but the way ES6 works, if you put an import statement at the top of your TypeScript code that says import from Angular material, all of material by default would end up in that bundle. What the tree shaker does is actually understand the code enough to go look through all of material and say, no, you're only using the material button and the material side nav, and the rest of it we can throw away. We don't actually need that. So in the ecosystem today, there are a number of tools which have emerged as capable tree shakers. Um, the first one I ever used was Rollup. Rollup is an ES6 bundler, and it has the ability, while it's bundling code, to look and see which declarations you're actually using, which classes, which functions. And it can remove the ones that you're not actually referencing. Webpack 2 also shipped with tree shaking functionality that was inspired by Rollup's design. Um, one that I was surprised to see on this list is Uglify.js. Uglify is a, a venerable JavaScript compressor. Its job is to make your bundle small. And it does a number of optimizations to achieve that. And one of the optimizations it can do is actually dead code elimination. It knows how to remove code that's not referenced. Um, so that's actually the tree shaking that powers the Angular CLI. We rely on an Uglify Webpack plugin under the hood to do that. And we actually have our own plugin we ship called Build Optimizer, which knows how to annotate Angular code to better tell Uglify what's used and what's not. And the last optimizer I wanted to mention is the Google Closure Compiler, uh, sometimes known as JS Compiler. And this one is interesting because it actually produces the smallest bundles. Uh, if you remember, Igor yesterday in his keynote talked about Hello World and Ivy being 2.7 kilobytes. That's with Closure Compiler um, doing the optimization. One of the, the challenges with Closure Compiler, though, is that it requires you to write your applications in a very specific way. It's very strict about the type of JavaScript that you write. And if you stray from that, it tends to, to kind of break applications in interesting ways. Um, so Closure requires, it's, it's, the benefits are amazing, but it requires a lot of buy-in in order to use it. Ivy, from the ground up, has been designed to be tree shaken by all of these optimizers. That's the reason we broke the runtime up from this big interpreter into smaller functions, separate instructions that get compiled with your templates. So if you're building an application and you don't need to use internationalization, you don't get internationalization instructions included in your compiled template. The tree shaker will notice you're not using those parts of the framework and can remove them. If you don't use content projection or SVG elements directly in your template, the, tree, the, the Angular compiler will not emit those instructions. The tree shaker will notice you're not using them and can remove them from the bundle. And this happens across the entire framework. Core concepts like dependency injection are designed in Ivy to be tree shakeable. If you can write an application that doesn't have an application injector, Right, that doesn't use DI at the ng-module level. Some simple applications might want to do this. And if you do, the tree shaker can remove those parts of DI from your bundle. 
This is a big improvement over what the view engine could do before. If you remember, the view engine consisted of a compiler that generated data structures and a runtime which traversed those data structures and interpreted them. And the problem with that is that the interpreter had to handle whatever template it got. We didn't know ahead of time whether you were going to use content projection, whether you're going to use internationalization or SVG. And so while we made that interpreter as small and as optimal as we could, fundamentally, the tree shaker could not break it up, could not remove parts of it. And there are other areas of the framework as well where tree shaking is difficult. Uh, one that comes up in particular is dynamic component instantiation. So this happens when you want to insert a component into a view somewhere, but you don't actually know which component that's going to be uh, until runtime. And this tends to come up in cases where you're doing things like overlays, or tool tips, or modal dialog boxes, right? where you have some part of your application that wants to render content, but you don't know what content until the rest of the app decides later. And so if you haven't done this in Angular, the way it works is you get this thing called the view container ref. And the view container ref kind of points to somewhere in the DOM where you can insert content. And then you take your, type, your component type that you want to insert, and you go to this thing called the component factory resolver. And you give your component type to the component factory resolver, and the resolver hands you back an ng factory for the component. And this is one of the cases in our APIs where factories have kind of leaked through to the user. Normally, we try to hide them. The CLI tries to keep them in the background and make, make sure you don't have to deal with them. But in this case, you actually have to get the factory in order to do something. And the trouble in this scenario is that this component factory resolver ends up not really being tree shakeable. And that's because it's essentially a giant map. It's a map of component type to ng factory. And the tree shaker looking at this map has no idea which component types you're going to look up at runtime. Right? How could it? Your application didn't even know. That's why you're inserting the component dynamically. And so the tree shaker has no choice but to, to see this code and say, OK, I just have to include all of it. Right? Uh, anything else might break your application. And Ivy deals away with this problem entirely. Because in Ivy, we've taken what used to be in the ng factory file and put it in those static fields on the component. So when you have your component type that you want to insert, it already has all the information on it that the runtime needs in order to do that. You can just hand it to the view container ref, and on you go. So Ivy is going to enable us to simplify a lot of our APIs around factories. All of this focus on making Angular tree shakeable and optimizable has paid off. If you take a Hello World application, compile it with Ivy, minify it, uh, compress it, you end up with a bundle of about 4.5 kilobytes. And Igor yesterday mentioned 2.7. That's with Clojure Compiler. 4.5 is actually with standard kind of Angular CLI type tree shaking. Um, we're pretty proud of this number. And a lot of people, when they hear this, actually this happened to me at the conference yesterday, um, tell me, OK, well, that's great, but my application is not Hello World, right? So is this actually relevant? Does it actually matter? And there are two very good reasons why we care about this number, even though that's true, right? Most applications are not Hello World. And the first one is, if you're, it gives us a really good metric for figuring out just how optimizable and just how tree shakeable we actually are. So if I'm sitting back and designing a framework feature, it's easy for me to rationalize and think, OK, most people are going to use something like content projection in their application. So it's OK if the code for content projection can't really be optimized away. Most applications are going to include it anyway. And that might be true. But if you do this across your entire feature set, now you've created a framework where nothing can be optimized. So what focusing on our hello world number does is keep us honest. It helps us meet our guarantee that most major parts of the framework should be optimizable, even if they're things which most applications use. And secondly, it turns out that this hello world example is actually representative of a real use case. We have Angular elements. 
And what Elements allows you to do is take a component that you wrote, package it up, and bundle it as a custom element, and then use it in an application that might not even be using Angular. Just drop it into an application somewhere else. And when you do this, you really want that bundle to be as small and efficient as possible. But also, it's very likely that the element you're packaging is not as complex as your average Angular application. Maybe you're, maybe you're packaging up something like a date picker. Um, and you probably won't be using content projection. You might not be using dependency injection. And so with Ivy, we can actually optimize those Angular element cases and tree shake them down to a level where they actually work when you deploy them to another application. Ivy is very efficient at this. So Ivy is designed to be fully optimizable by the current suite of JavaScript tooling. The thing is, though, new tooling is being invented almost, it seems like, every day. I read about a new bundler or a new optimizer. And there are also optimizations, which are known. Certain optimizers can do them, but they haven't made their way out to the, the full tool chain yet. There's some things Closure Compiler can do regarding moving code around, for example, that would really benefit lazy loading. And we expect to see that in, in kind of other uh, more commonly used optimizers eventually. And when that happens, Ivy will be ready for it. The second goal that I talked about, second main goal for Ivy, was this thing called incrementality. We wanted to speed up the compilation process dramatically. Both of Ivy's previous renderers, the View Engine and the template compiler before it, used something called global compilation. And what that means is when you typed ng build prod into the CLI, it would run TypeScript to compile your application. It would run ngc, which would generate ng factories for the templates and other Angular types in your application. But ngc would also compile the components and directives in all of the libraries that you were importing, all of your dependencies. So we would compile those libraries during the application build. And this is in contrast to incremental compilation, where libraries get compiled and deployed on NPM. And by the time you import them, there's no work remaining to do. The application build can then only build the application classes that you're interested in. And you link them together, and you're good to go. Right? The application and the libraries are compiled separately. A good way to think about that is if you use Material in your applications. Material is already fully compiled, ready to go when you NPM install it. And it sounds like that's a much better world, right? And it, it would be. It's fairly difficult to get there, actually. To do it in Ivy, we've implemented a rule that we call locality on the team. And locality is pretty simple to explain. It means that when we're compiling an Angular component or a directive, and that component or directive depends on other Angular pieces, like its module or other components or directives, we can only refer to them using information that's known about their public APIs. That means that we have two really nice properties. One is that it will be safe to ship the code we generate to NPM. And the second is that we can actually compile them without needing to know too much about those dependencies. In fact, we can do it with the information that's in the DTS files. We don't need any extra metadata about the code. Now, in Ivy, we actually add some information to the DTS files for the Angular public API, things like selectors, et cetera. Um, but we can rely on, purely on TypeScript to pass this information along for us. So here's a simple example of locality in action. In Angular, your components can have inputs. And the name that your users bind to for the input does not actually have to be the same as the name of the field that the value gets written to on the component. You can think of the name of the input, the property name, the one you bind to, as public API. And you can think of the name of the field that it gets written to as an implementation detail. And in fact, it's possible for a component to change the name of its fields without actually breaking anybody using that component in their templates, because they've kept the property name the same. Which means that if you had a binding and you were to generate code like this, 
where you're writing the new value to the field directly using the field name, you're actually relying on part of the directive's private API. And that's OK. It's still going to work. But that means that any time that component or directive changes, we have to regenerate this code because we have to assume that the name of the field might have been changed. Right? We don't know what the library author did when they published their new patch version. And that's one of the reasons why Angular today relies on global compilation, because we regenerate all of this code only once we know everything about your application up front. Another way you might imagine doing this is by only ever referring to that input by its property name, the public name. And you would probably introduce some function, here I've called it bind, which at runtime would look up on that component what field that property goes to. At runtime, we have that metadata, right? And then write the value out to the right field. And this code would be safe to ship on NPM. It would be safe to leave it in place even if the field name changed, because we're only relying on the input by its public API name. And in fact, this is exactly what Ivy does. When Ivy sees a property binding, it generates an element property instruction. And the element property instruction takes in the property name of the input and the new value, looks up in the directive def or component def which field that goes to, and then writes the value out. And that means that Ivy code is safe to ship on NPM. It's safe to build libraries in advance of the application. We don't need to recompile them every time you update their dependencies. So Vue Engine ran afoul of, of this in a lot of different places. Um, here's another example. This is our template from before, uh, compiled with Vue Engine. And what I want you to focus on is this line here concerning the uh, ng-if directive. And there's some magic numbers in here, but um, D the DID function is a directive definition. And what I want you to pay attention to is the array in here with view container ref and template ref. And these are the constructor parameters of ngif that need to be injected, written into the template generated for our application. These are private API of ngif. If ngif is updated behind the scenes, like if the Angular team decides we need enough to inject something else, it wouldn't break your template, but it might break the code we generate for it. And that's why we only generate that code at the very end for application bundles. In Ivy, if you remember, these constructor injected parameters go into the factory function for the definition. So here's ngif, which has directive def, and it has a factory function that's injecting its two parameters. And this code is safe to ship to NPM. It means that consumers who rely on ngif don't need to know what its private constructor parameters are. NGIF has that information encoded on it. All they need to know to do is call its public factory function. That's locality in action. And you can think of Ivy, therefore, as providing a stable API for generated Angular code to be deployed on NPM and then consumed by other applications. And because of that, we took what used to be a big monolithic global compile and split it up so we can build libraries and applications that depend on them separately. Right? And that not only builds things much faster, um, but also enables us to simplify how libraries are packaged. We don't need to ship as much metadata because we only rely on their public API. So Ivy builds are fast and incremental as a result. And the last benefit that I, of Ivy that I wanted to talk about is its flexibility. Ivy, the Ivy project in general has never been about delivering exciting new features on the day that we ship Ivy. Instead, it's about, been about taking the Angular that our users know and love and making it better. Right? Faster compiles, smaller bundles, better debugability. But at the same time, when we're undertaking this big effort, we wanted to make sure that our design would give us a foundation for building all of the cool features that we wanted to do and that our users wanted us to do. Right? We wanted to make sure that our, our technical direction was good. And it turns out Ivy actually is really good at this. The instruction set makes us very extensible. We can take an existing Angular feature, 
which is compiled to a couple instructions. And we can write new instructions to implement that feature in a totally different way. And as long as we don't remove the old instructions, they'll continue to work. Existing code continues to work. And we can evolve the framework over time in a very clean fashion. Right? If, we're if we're writing a new feature, it's really easy. You just introduce new instructions. There are some things, though, that Ivy does get us purely out of the box by the nature of its design. One really interesting one is a case of hybrid applications, where you have a mostly AOT compiled app, but you want to use JIT somewhere. Um, think of this as like dollar compile from AngularJS. So if, you want, if you're willing to pay the cost of shipping the compiler to the browser, you can actually have a component which has its template generated at runtime, compile that with JIT, and then insert it into your AOT application, and the two can talk to each other seamlessly. Ivy does this as a direct result of incrementality. We've also been able to remove a lot of the complexity around ng factories. We still generate them, because applications still import them, um, but we generate shims that actually don't do much under the hood. And so in the future, we'll be able to optimize these APIs. We'll be able to make our bootstrapping API simpler. We'll be able to do, make lazy loading a lot simpler. Right now, really the only way to lazy load Angular code reliably with a good build story is with the CLI. And in Ivy, we think we can do better than this. And Jason, in his talk coming up, will actually show you a demo of this. And finally, ng factories have kind of been a stumbling point for users, because we hide them from you in the beginning, and then all of a sudden you might have encounter it in some you know, situation, something you're trying to do. So we've been able to remove a major pain point from the library. And going beyond the kind of immediate future, um, you'll still be able to write templates normally, of course, as HTML. But you might imagine some components with complex or unusual views might benefit from being, having their templates handwritten in the Ivy kind of assembly language instruction syntax instead of being compiled and translated from HTML. And we're thinking about how we can create an ecosystem around this, how we can empower the library authors in our community to come up with interesting and powerful abstractions on top of Ivy's low-level APIs. One commonly requested feature for example, is the ability to write higher order components, which is a component that gets wrapped by a function, and the function kind of adds behavior or does something else to the component, and then you use that in your application. Ivy actually makes this possible, and we're thinking of ways we can do that. So it really does provide for us a flexible foundation for Angular in the future. Our team is deeply focused on making the Angular we have today more optimizable, making it compile incrementally, getting this foundation up and running. And once those are achieved, we have a long list of ideas that we want to investigate. So in summary, Ivy is a significant refactoring. It aims to simplify much of Angular's internal complexity. By removing the need for ng factory files, we can simplify our bootstrapping story, we can improve lazy loading, and we can get rid of a common user stumbling block. Our granular instruction set is making templates more optimizable and making the framework itself tree shakeable. And through our switch from global to incremental compilation, we've been able to make builds faster and at the same time reduce the requirements on libraries, which is another kind of common pain point and stumbling block. And we're confident that our users will love these improvements to Angular, and we're working really hard to finish all of these pieces and get this into your hands to see what you can do, for, do with it. But if you can't wait for that, and you're interested to see kind of more of Ivy in action, I highly recommend going to Jason's talk immediately after the break in track one, where he's going to show you some examples of applications running Ivy today in action. Thank you very much for having me. That's all I have for you. Thank you, Alex. It's brilliant to see. It's great. Um, so we have the panel later today, so please do head on over to Slido, use the event code Angular Connect, and you can ask uh, a panel of the Google team any question you'd like. After the break, uh, we've got lots going on, 
Um, so that all kicks off at 10.40, so see you all then. Thank you.
Hello everybody, welcome back. So, continuing on our Ivy theme, and from Alex's talk this morning about the theory of Ivy, we've now got a talk about Ivy, but this time a much more uh, practical example. Jason's been part of the Google Core team for the past two years, so please put your hands together and make very welcome to the stage, Jason. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Good. 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 Okay, a couple in the front are okay. Uh, I've never been in front of a screen this big, so I have to selfie it. And the audience. Hey. All right. Um, so I'm here to talk about. Oh, I have my password problem, just like Alex did. I'm here to talk about uh, Ivy by example. Um, and uh, as Alex said, Ivy's moving along. There's a couple of examples that we're going to show here. Not everything I wanted to show is going to be quite ready. So we've also added a little segment here for router updates since I work on the router. Um, we're also going to talk a little bit about the router at the end. So um, as was mentioned, I'm on the Angular core team, been there for a couple of years now. Um, I'm going to skip through this because we're a little bit short on time. Um, and I'm just going to jump straight into uh, debugging um, with Ivy. And I'm going to end up looking at my phone a little bit because I have to switch back and forth between the presentation and the examples. So my notes are over here. Um, but from a developer's perspective, one of the first things that I think people will notice uh, when Ivy lands is uh, a bit of a better debugging experience. Um, you saw some of the generated code that Alex showed. Uh, it's, it's a little bit clearer, or it can be a lot clearer than the existing view engine code, and to really see what's happening. Um, again, this, one of the reasons here is we don't have this factory file that sort of lives in between uh, when we're debugging in Ivy. Also, the stack traces tend to be much smaller. So in the example that I'll show here, um, the stack traces are really short. Uh, just kind of gets like right to the point. You're not bouncing around through a whole bunch of different files to figure out where your errors are. And um, most of the template errors can actually be reasoned about by looking at the generated code itself, right? With the view engine, you get this, um, you get this uh, generated uh, data structure. Um, it's a little bit easier to reason about, you know, imperative code that's actually creating DOM or looks more like it's creating DOM in Ivy. And the last thing, um, I think it was maybe yesterday, there's some new debugging APIs that landed uh, very recently, so we'll talk about that. Um, if, oops, I don't think we need this one. If, who, who here has done AngularJS work? Okay, a whole bunch. Uh, you remember debugging AngularJS? You remember this API, um, Angular Element? Anybody use, who's used that? Yeah, right? You use that all the time. Uh, you can get your controllers, you can get like access to that scope thing uh, that we, some of us remember. Um, and we don't really have an equivalent for that in Angular today. Well, today we do. Um, so there's a new, new API published on a window called ng, and you can do things like get component, get directive, um, get the injector, et cetera. So we'll take a look at some of that stuff. So, all right, let's jump straight into a demo. And I have to find which one this is. Let me see here. Okay, so here we have just basically a... Oh yeah, no problem. All right, how's that? The, the, the actual like, uh, text here doesn't necessarily matter. This is sort of a, an example to do app. We have this app sitting in the Angular repo. It's one of the um, applications that we use for sort of testing uh, inside the Angular repo, make sure things are still working, um, make sure Ivy's uh, progressing along well. Um, and it's just your basic to do app. I think most of us have seen an application like this, right? Who's seen these before? 
Okay, just about everybody. All right. Uh, so there's a couple of errors that are going to like pop up in in this application, but most of it kind of just works. Um, and this is compiled with Ivy. If I but if I double click here, like I'm supposed to be able to edit uh, this to do, and we see here we get a, a relatively short um, uh, stack trace here. And one of the really nice things about Ivy is that, at least in the not um, obfuscated mode, you get names. I'll try to zoom in on this a little bit. You can you can see the name of the function that's being run, and it kind of makes sense, right? So this is the to, to do app component. We went into a section that's a tag li a tag the input, and this is the template for for the input. So just from the just straight away from the name, we get a lot of context. But now, if we click in to uh, to the actual code here, uh, we can we can see that I think Alex showed how Ivy runs in sort of two modes. What, the first pass when the template is uh, run is the creation mode, and the second pass is the mode uh, that's going to update on bindings. So we see this this um, variable here RF render flags and two down here is where we're doing um, updates. So this, this uh, error didn't occur until we actually double clicked and something changed, then now we're trying to read a new value. So if I put a breakpoint in here and we do the same thing, um, we can see that uh, basically the context, which is your to-do components, your, your actual component instance, that context doesn't contain uh, this variable called Todd. Uh, it was a typo. So we can basically just fix that typo by moving the decimal point over. Um, but one of the nice things here, I, th I think, is that we can really clearly understand by looking at this template exactly where things are happening, right? So again, this is in the um, update mode. But we have another error that might pop up in um, sort of the creation block. So it didn't pop up initially. But when you're creating elements, um, you also w want to wire up the listeners for elements. So if I uh, type a to do here, um, we've got an error that will fire if I hit enter twice. So if I come back to the console and we come to the look for the uh, template here, so the error is occurring in uh, stemming from to do app component, the template, input, and the key up listener. So if we come back here, we're actually um, operating here. This listener was wired up during the uh, creation mode. Again, we can put a breakpoint in here. Refret. Uh, that was the wrong button. There's me. Um, we can do. This okay. Um, refresh and we can um, hit enter here. We can pass through and I believe it's the second time that we hit this. Um, oh, no, sorry. We need to hit enter and second time. Second time we second time we do it after actually adding a value. Um, we can step in. To the component, uh, to the actual component code here, we have an add to do, uh, and it's reading this property, which happens to be null. Um, so we get we get into the controller. We see that this is null in this case. Um, due to time, I'm not actually going to fix these errors, but you can kind of see how coming from the template, you can sort of reason about um, uh, where things are created, where the events are actually wired up, because you can actually see it in the code, as opposed to looking at factory files where you would be looking at essentially data structures, uh, and the interp interpreter would run later. Okay. What I am going to do is play through this, and I'm going to show this um, new API. Uh, who, who here knows? Um, Matthias on the Angular team. Okay. Uh, I think I was talking to you, Pete, about Matthias tends to be like right at the last minute and sometime last night around like 
2 a.m. his time, he said, hey, it's landed. So, um, so this is a new, new feature that just made it in there. And um, with this feature, you can do things like inspect element. Um, so we're inspecting on the input element. And if you've got a handle on a DOM element, one, one thing that would be really nice to be able to do is just find the component that kind of controls this piece of DOM. So if we come over to the console, uh, $0 refers to the currently selected element in the elements panel. And if we use ng get component, we, pa we pass in an element. We'll assign that to a variable CMP. Um, we actually get the component, the component instance here. Now, just to prove that a lot of things that Alex said uh, earlier about everything kind of being contained in the component, if we go component.constructor, uh, so this is the, um, the class that you've created, on, or the, that's um, created and, and the class that we get an instance of. If we go to ng uh, component def, we can see all the things that Alex talked about earlier, right? We can see the factory. Um, we can see the template function. Uh, we can see the selectors. Uh, we can drill in here. We can see that this select this uh, to do app is the selector, right? So everything is contained in here, and with this new debugging API, you can just get direct access to it. Um, this API um, also has. Uh, there's a couple others. There's one for get component. There's one for get directives. There's one for get uh, injector, and a few others. Okay. So, all right. So now, that was that's one thing on some of the debugging stuff. Um, we've improved the debugging cycle, uh, the the powerful runtime debugging in the command line. Um, I believe that my last statement here about source maps are coming is accurate, right, Alex? Yeah. Um, so once the source maps uh, support lands, you know, you'll be able to go straight from your HTML rather than going into the, the um, IV output code. You'll be able to go from your HTML into, step into the IV output and then into your components. Makes it a little bit better. Um, okay. Now, this is the topic, uh, lazy loading. I work on the router, and so lazy loading is something that um, I'm concerned with on a regular basis. Um, but one question would be, why, why would we do it? Well, a lot of apps, you end up with lots and lots of files. These files become large. And most of your users don't interact with all of these files, all the JavaScript that you've written, at the same time. Most of your users are going to land on a home on like a home page. They're going to interact with that. They're going to transition somewhere else. That's kind of why we built lazy loading into the router. Additionally, it'd be kind of nice if you could do things like lazy load pieces of Angular, right? Uh, maybe your home page only needs Angular Common or Angular Core in order to render. Why load things like material and animations in order to just render that? So lazy loading today is handled by the router. Um, we use this magic string, right? Load children. Uh, and uh, that string is looked for by the compiler, and um, the code in order to do the lazy loading is output by the compiler. It's pretty complex to customize um, that process. And I actually had a slide of our documentation on it, but it was too small to show. We don't actually document very well how to customize it, even if you wanted to. Um, it, it's not documented very well, like how to do your own lazy loading implementation. So lazy loading with Ivy is a lot different. It works on standardized APIs. And one of the advantages there is uh, we can use existing tooling. You don't have to go through something like the CLI. You could just use Webpack out of the box. Um, additionally, it's a lot easier to document. So there's this thing, dynamic imports. Uh, and it's documented, MDN documents it well. Uh, essentially, it's the same as your import statements in ES6, uh, ES2015, uh, but instead of uh, getting access immediately, you get, you get a promise returned. Um, so the module will eventually load, and you get the, uh, the value back here. So one of the nice things about that is you can use the await statement. 
you can make it look kind of nice. Um, my widget component, we can do an import on my widget. Um, and this is supported in TypeScript. So if you go to MDN, you'll see that you have to put the .js on there. Um, all the pathing has to kind of work out correctly. But with TypeScript, as long as, like in this case, my widget is installed in NPM modules or in node modules, um, it's going to go ahead and be able to resolve the, uh, the path. So this would be the first thing that we would do in order to enable lazy loading with Ivy, standard APIs. And then I think Alex also showed this. Uh, the, we're we're going to have to get access to or uh, resolve the component factory. In Ivy world, this is very simple, and it can be simplified in the future. For now, we would use the existing APIs. And we're going to use view container ref to create the component. So in the same vein as lazy loading, a couple of people have asked about this thing, dynamic builds. And dynamic builds would be a way to um, distribute entire applications, fully built applications, and let one application consume another complete, uh, fully built application. So this might make sense on like really large teams um, where uh, a given team really wants to have control of the entire stack, the entire build all the way through. Or another where maybe one app consumes another, uh, maybe something like adding um, a Hangouts application to Gmail, you could conceive that the Hangouts team would want to do the build themselves and distribute a, a fully bundled um, distributable file. So this becomes very easy with Ivy. Um, basically, loading of dynamic builds works, I say out of the box, it's almost out of the box. Um, I was up late debugging this with Kara, and we found a problem in the instruction set. This is why some of the, you know, the Ivy stuff, as we work on these examples, we find um, issues. But uh, she was able to debug it quickly. So we do have a working example. Um, so um, OK, so sorry, this, this is basically why it works. And we've kind of already looked at this. I think Alex talked about it enough. Uh, the fact that everything is local. Um, we have this locality principle. The component itself contains all the information it needs in order to um, create itself. OK, so let's do a little demo of this. So I'm going to come out here. Um, this is a very similar to do app. Uh, it's basically the same app, but we're bundling it much differently. So if we come into roll up here, um, I'm just going to output it as common JS for now. Um, the hardest part about getting all this to work was just uh, getting the bundling to work and getting the import statement to actually do what it's supposed to do. Ivy was pretty straightforward to get it to, uh, to, to work correctly. But anyway, I'm going to do the uh, common JS format. Um, we're going to create a file uh, in dist called to do app. And uh, in this little build file, after uh, generating all the code, we're also going to output a package JSON file. Um, you could do this in different ways, but I'm going to output this package JSON file so that I can npm install it into another application. But that other application isn't going to do anything. It's not going to use it. Uh, uh, the compiler is not going to use any info from um, this to-do app in order to compile itself. So I'm going to run, um, run a build here. I'm in the trash. Uh, sorry, this is to-do app. Okay. So we're just doing uh, the basic bundling here, not, not compressing it, not doing any uh, particular um, optimizations on it. And the build, we have a single file, which is our whole application. This is, again, no optimizations to it. It's 300 and something lines. It's about 16K. Um, but there's tree shaking that could be done and optimization. And we publish the DTS files. It's important to publish DTS files so that uh, on the other side, you'll see on the other side, we want type ahead. We want the consumers of these built applications to be able to get type ahead into, uh, into our project. 
and a simple package JSON file. So if I come over here to, um, this is now a CLI app, and this is a CLI app where we're building with Ivy. So I should be able to do ng serve and show the application. I'm going to find it. OK. We'll blow this up a little bit. So um, there's just a button here. All that it, it doesn't look like a button much here, but uh, it is a button. Um, all that we're tr going to try to do when we click this button is go out and uh, dynamically load this application that some other team has built, and we want to just drop it onto this page, OK? Um, at the same time, after we've dropped it onto the page, we want to not show the welcome anymore. We just want to show the to-do app. Uh, so if I come back into the CLI app. All right, so I come back in here. Um, the first thing I have to do, actually, is I have to produce um, I have to simulate that we're on NPM. So I'm going to see, uh, change into the dist folder. And I'm going to do an NPM uh, pack. All that this is going to do is create a tarball that we can install in the other app. It's identical to publishing to NPM. Um, it's the best way to guarantee that you're similar to publishing to NPM. And then we can do an NPM install. Uh, to do to do app dist. Do app, and we'll grab this tarball. This will go and install this other application in ours. And we'll turn back on ng serve. So uh, our template here is, basic, uh, is very simple. We have a button with a click. Uh, we say load to do app. And inside of here, we want to import um, this application that we've now built. So if we come in here, we can do import. Uh, I'm going to just do my shortcut here, import to do app. So uh, we're running the import function uh, with a then on it. And we're asking for, uh, to by destructuring here, to get access to the to do app component. And TypeScript is smart enough to know what this type is. Uh, we're not using it, so it grays it out. But it knows what type it is, because it can follow this, uh, this dynamic import and um, pull out the DTS files. So if we were to just save this right now, we're not actually going to do anything. But what we should see is that the then has run. And after the then is run, we're going to set to do's loaded to true. And so the welcome should go away. Before we do that, let's just go over the network and make sure that we haven't already downloaded this code. When we click this, we see we get this file called 0.js. Um, Webpack has renamed it to 0.js. But it is uh, ex exactly what we had published on the other side. OK? Does that make sense? OK. So now, now we just need to uh, implement um, taking this to-do app and dropping it onto the page. So the component factory is what we need. Um, so we're going to get component factory resolver, and we're going to do resolve component factory. This is not, this, this is an IV-specific implementation. It's a very thin wrapper, since we already have access to the component factory. It's already bundled in with this component. It's just sort of a thin wrapper. And then we're also going to uh, run the create component code. So we're going to get the view container reference uh, and create component. We're going to pass in this factory that we just created or that we just got. And that should be all that we need. Hopefully it works. So we should be able to uh, click Manage To-Dos. Again, uh, we haven't already loaded anything. And we click this, and now the To-Do app is fully loaded. <laughs> so
So this is a much different um, lazy loading experience than we currently have in Angular, right? Um, being able to do this type of lazy loading on an individual component by component basis is pretty cool. Like you as developers would now have control over how you want to split your apps. It doesn't just have to be by route, right? Um, so I think this is awesome. Okay. Uh, again, real quick. So sta it's standard based. We give the developer control. We give the teams flexibility of how they want to build. I think, Alex, you talked about some of this already. We want, there's new stuff that will be coming um, with Ivy eventually. Things like dynamic template composition. Um, you want to generate forms on the fly, things like that. Go ahead. Zoneless APIs will uh, make it so to make the zoneless experience much better. And I think, as Alex said, higher order components. Uh, this is an area that we definitely want to focus on. OK, so that's it for now on the examples on Ivy. Uh, I kind of ran out of things that were working well enough to continue showing. Um, uh, so I'm going to really quickly, I have a few minutes left. I, would, I just want to talk about a couple of updates that we've done recently on routing, because um, I think it might be interesting. So first of all, why? We had a number of people that were having upgrade pains. Uh, this is really where it started from. We had applications, I'm sure some of you have this experience, that are stuck on an AngularJS router um, and the Angular router running at the same time, and both of them trying to uh, read the global URL state and react to it. And it res resulted in a lot of unpredictable behavior, um, really around um, uh, like redirects and um, like if a guard were to fail trying to redirect somewhere else, there was a lot of really unpredictable behavior there. So one thing that we did uh, initially was the, this thing, URL update strategy. Um, currently in Angular, we go through this process. We um, parse and match to the route. We run guards and resolvers. And then at the same time, in the same, um, in the same pass, synchronously, we both update the URL and we activate the route, which means we render it. We've added an option, uh, and then, sorry, and then after that, navigation and event fires. We've added an option when you're configuring the router to switch to this eager update mode. So the first thing that happens is parse. We then update the URL. As long as we know that it's a good URL, we go ahead and update it right away. Uh, after that, we make sure we find the route that you're supposed to get to. We run the guards and resolvers, just like we did before. We activate the route and render, and we do the navigation end event. Um, the reason that this was needed was some applications have this use case of like, hey, I can't get to my page, but I still want the URL to represent the page I was trying to go to. Right? If a guard current in prior to this feature, if a guard were to fail, you can't land on the URL you're trying to get to and show like a 404. It just it's really really hard. So this opens up that type of use case. And this is how you, you would use it: router module for root, and you just pass the URL update strategy eager. Okay, I'm going to blitz through some of these other ones. Um, navigation cancellation and cleanup. So right now we do something like this. We initially navigate, you click, say your user clicks a link. It's going to start running guards and resolvers. For really large apps, sometimes these can take a long time. While one is running, somebody clicks another, somebody clicks another link. What happens? Well, this guards and resolvers, these sets of guards and resolvers continue to run, but their result is ignored. However, the new navigation was waiting for those to finish. Okay? It's not less than ideal. We're in an observable world. We should be able to not have to wait um, and not have to just ignore the result. We should be able to just go straight to the new navigation and start the next set of guards and resolvers and then activate the route. Um, there were additional problems. What happens if during one of these guards or resolvers you were to perform a redirect? Well, now you've got something that's running asynchronously, say it takes five seconds, and in those five seconds somebody clicks the next link. Now there's a new navigation that got queued up, and then the old one, because the resolvers are still running, or sorry, a guard is still running and it fails, that one redirects you to a new URL. Uh, now you're not where you expected at all, right? 
Um, so this was a big problem. So what we've done is we've updated this uh, by just sort of using um, observables a, a bit better. So when somebody goes through this process and they click that second link, we go back to this, uh, this running guards and resolvers and we cancel it. Um, so if you're using observables all the way through, it will fully cancel, it'll stop the HTTP request, it'll do a full cleanup. Uh, and so it's not just ignored, it's actually cleaned up. And so we immediately do that and we immediately start the next navigation. So there's no longer this like delay that can happen if your guards and resolvers take a long time. That, that's gone. Um, we also guarantee now that there's only ever one navigation running at any given time. So prior to this, there could be multiples running and you could have side effects from those. Um, so that's, that's now fixed. So it's a performance boost, it's more predictable, and it eliminated a ton of bugs. And the last one I'll go through really quickly is um, we had a problem with uh, guards. They run asynchronously. Multiple guards could redirect in one given asynchronous time. And the last one would win. There was no way to negotiate um, which, which redirect from a guard might win. So we've introduced a new API that guarantees priority of failures. And the API is specifically that you can now, from a guard, return Boolean or URL tree. So if you just do like a router.parse URL, you can redirect to login and you can return that from your guard. What Angular will do is it will take, it, it will figure out the priority, okay? So let's say you have all your can activate guards that might run in any given route, authenticated, authorized, and module is active. Well, you really care about authenticated most, right? They definitely can't get there if they're not authenticated. But if module is active, let's say, returns false first, um, we're gonna wait because we know that these other two haven't returned a result yet. Okay, prior to this change, um, we would have just stopped execution on the first guard that returned false. Um, but let's say authorized returns a redirect to slash permissions. Well, authenticated still hasn't returned, so we're gonna make sure that authenticated returns, if it returns true and it says yes, you're authenticated, but no, you don't have auth um, authority, we're gonna redirect you to slash permissions. Uh, similarly, if authenticated instead returned login, that's the highest priority, we're gonna redirect you to slash login. Um, and if just like as was prior, if uh, the last one returns false and the earlier returns true, we're just gonna cancel out the navigation. Um, so hopefully this like gives you a lot more predictability with uh, how your navigations happen. Uh, you can sort of construct things with this knowledge for can deactivate, uh, for can deactivate guards, it's the same priority but in reverse. So it's from the, uh, from the closest to where you're coming from and then it goes back up for can deactivate. And uh, yeah, so it's good. We got a uh, directly supported redirect API, reli reliable guard sequencing, and, I th and it's on master. It should, I think we have a release coming today that publishes that. So 7.2, I believe, is released today. So, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Um, we're running a little bit late, so probably just a minute or two to change over and then we're gonna kick off again. Thank you.
Um, our next speaker, Alana, is studying at San Jose State University, but worked on uh, creating tools and documentation to help developers upgrade from AngularJS to Angular. So she's a brilliant person to have here today to talk to us about just that. So please give a round of applause to Alana. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name's Alana Olson, and today I'm going to give a presentation on how we can help developers improve their experiences with migrating from AngularJS to Angular. So right now, there's an enormous universe of migration approaches out there today, and it can be really difficult to understand which approach is right for your application. In fact, it can be really challenging, actually. You might want to throw up that white flag and quit altogether, because migrating can feel very daunting and overwhelming sometimes. And we're, I've heard from lots of people that they have challenges with migrating. But I'm here today to tell you to get ready, because it doesn't have to be as difficult as it may feel, and we want to help prepare you so that you don't feel so overwhelmed with your migration process. So today I'm going to cover three different things. The first is some new migration tools that are available today to help you guys. The second are some awesome advocates who have already spoken today and yesterday and are out there in the world to help you. And the third are other resources that you can utilize so that you can improve your migration approach. So a little bit about me. Again, my name is Alana. And over the summer, I interned on the Google Angular team as a developer relations intern. Developer relations entails three things. First, you're talking with the community. You're asking each and every one of you, what are your experiences? How do you enjoy migrating? Do you enjoy migrating? What challenges are you facing? And then I translate those experiences into tools and documentation that we could provide to help improve your experience overall. Finally, I do exactly what I'm doing today. I share back out with you on what we've built and how it can actually help you. So before I continue using some terminology, I want to clarify them. When I refer to Angular, I'm talking about versions 2 plus. So that means Angular of today and tomorrow. And when I refer to Angular JS, I'm talking about versions 1.x. So let's talk about the tools that I built over the summer. One is called NG Migration Assistant. NG Migration Assistant is an analysis tool that scans your AngularJS application and provides a customized recommendation on which approach is right for you and for your application. And I want to give a quick little demo of it so you can really see exactly what's going on. So here we're in an example application. It's the Angular Phone Cat app that's in the AngularJS documentation. And after you install the NPM package, all you have to do is type in NGMA, which stands for uh, NG Migration Assistant. And you'll get this whole list of things. First is the criteria that we're looking for. We want you to be well informed about what we're actually scanning for so that we don't have this miraculous recommendation kind of pull out of thin air. We want you to trust the system and understand exactly what we're looking for. And so we also provide statistics on your application. These st statistics are found by analyzing your application based on how large it is, how many files you have, um, which AngularJS patterns are found. And when I refer to AngularJS patterns, I mean practices that you used in AngularJS that are not transferable to Angular. Next, we give you a recommendation. And this recommendation is customized to each and every application. Now, this recommendation goes, takes your, the statistics from your application and funnels it through a decision tree and produces a recommendation like this. So for this application, we recommend to use ng-upgrade, but you have to follow certain preparation steps first. And the final aspect is this files that contain AngularJS patterns and need to be modified. We want to provide you with the very first steps in order to take this migration approach, and this is where you can find them. We identify each and every file that contains certain AngularJS patterns, so you know where to start going in your application and what to start fixing. In the recommendation section previously, we also identify how you can start fixing those AngularJS patterns. So let's look at the criteria a little bit more. 
First is the complexity. That's looking at how many components you have and exactly how big your application really is. We look at your app size as well, so we're looking at the source lines, of source lines, which means it helps us determine the feasibility of certain migration approaches over others. We also look at how many files and folders you have, again, the AngularJS patterns, and the preparation steps necessary. So some of these AngularJS patterns that I'm talking about are JavaScript, because now Angular's written on TypeScript, root scope, compile, controllers, and component directives. We also provide app statistics, again. So in this example, we outline the criteria that you have and then exactly what we found. Here we found two controllers that will need to be converted and one AngularJS component. We found a roughly 18,000 lines of code, which puts you in a ballpark a little bit above rewriting your entire application from scratch, and a file count as well. The recommendation section is important because it identifies exactly how you can convert those AngularJS patterns to Angular compatible patterns. So if you find root scope, we recommend converting them into services. When we find controllers, you want to convert them into AngularJS component directives, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. And finally, we have this files to prepare section. Again, we identify all of the patterns found in each and every file so that you can start from each file when migrating. So I'm really excited to actually start announcing some new features that we've created. Right now, this is a command line tool that you install with, as an NPM package and then you just run a command. But that's not really able to reach all the developers out there. So we wanted to create a desktop application. You can view your results a little more easily using this Electron app. A very popular request is an automated template conversion tool. There's an API that we're gonna use that syntactically transforms your AngularJS HTML templates to compa Angular compatible HTML templates. So all those little directives you had to just slightly modify, like ng source, now this template conversion tool will do it for you. And finally, we're improving our enhanced analysis through AST parsing. We want to provide a more accurate search criteria and get more accurate results for your recommendation so it truly is customized to each and every application. I'm really excited about these features. And I think you guys should be too because they really are out there to help you. And this is all coming from the community. We've asked you what you need and now we're trying to provide it for you. So what's next for NG Migration Assistant? I want you to tell us what we can do. Reach out on the forum that I'll post later and tell us exactly what you would like to see with a migration tool approach. Now, why are so many people switching to Angular? That can seem like somewhat of an obvious answer. Coming from a developer, you understand the technical benefits. But just to reiterate, Angular is fast, it's simple, and it's built on the modern web. So we really want to emphasize you building new features in Angular. Some of the key differences that occurred when switching between AngularJS and Angular were a component-based architecture and TypeScript. Now, a component-based architecture helps standardize and simplify how we build Angular applica AngularJS applications and Angular applications. If you follow the rule of one approach, you can simplify and organize how your application is built so that you have one component per file. You can also use component directives, which help bridge the gap between a directive, which is in AngularJS when we're talking about directives, and a component, which is in Angular. Component directives were introduced in AngularJS version 1.5. They truly bridge this gap because before you couldn't just jump from a directive to a component. And I want to outline really what the key differences are here. So a directive, as we know, is just markers on a DOM element that are compiled to manipulate HTML elements and their children. This is an example of what one directive looks like. A component directive is just a specific type of directive that allows you to define templates and controllers and bindings. And an Angular component 
defines a class associated with an HTML template that then defines and displays a UI. So this is how we transition from a directive to an Angular component. And this is a big step when using different migration approaches. Now the other aspect is TypeScript. Switching to TypeScript can be as simple as installing the TypeScript compiler, switching your extensions from .js to .ts, and retroactively adding types to your functions and variables. It isn't always that simple, but for many applications it can be. TypeScript allows for enhanced error reporting and reduces runtime errors because it's catching it in build time. And that's a huge reason why they switched to TypeScript. This in turn produces a faster time to market if we're catching more bugs in build time. So I want to talk about a forum that I created in conjunction with NG Migration Assistant. It's called NG Migration Forum. And this is a community hub where you can go and learn about migrating in general. It's community driven, it's community updated, it's community run. Though I created it, it's really kind of a platform to let you guys adopt what you want from it. And I want to show you what it looks like. So if you come here, you'll see this is the front page. And right here, I have actually included my slides to this talk. But let's go to a Y upgrade page. This is an important page because we get a lot of questions from different developers on how can they sell to the decision makers in their company why switching to Angular is so important. You know the technical benefits, but translating that into business benefits can be difficult. So we outline the major changes that occurred between AngularJS and Angular. We identify the benefits of using Angular. And one of the key ones is that Angular is not just a framework, it's a platform. There's a huge team dedicated towards helping you. And they're out there in order to provide a better experience when using Angular. We also have a Migration Paths overview page. This is a key aspect of the migration forum because here is a first place where you can kind of understand all of the different migration approaches out there today. It identifies the key differences between two different migration approaches, which would be incremental and big bang or rewriting from scratch. Incremental is essentially taking one part of your application and building it up in Angular, whereas big bang is dropping it where it is and starting new. It then identifies the different migration approaches that are within those two sects of migration. So for example, it has ng upgrade, Angular elements, routing or hybrid routing, code conversion, rewriting from scratch. And if you want to learn more, you can just click on the page and it'll identify exactly how these migration approaches work. So for ng upgrade, it tells you exactly how it works. It also provides the different types of ng upgrade. So now there's ng upgrade for performance, and then there's also the whole package as well. It gives you the preparation steps needed for using that migration approach. So for ng upgrade, you have to be at a minimum threshold to start migrating. And part of that is uh, slowly transitioning out of those AngularJS patterns that we found. It identifies different testing. And most importantly, it gives you the awesome tools and examples out there today to help you understand this migration approach in a real life application. So each one of these migration approaches has a page similar to this. And it's helpful when trying to understand the differences between them. We also have a helpful contents page. And that's where we list articles, talks, and tutorials that can help you with your migration approach. This is where you can present new ideas that you've just published about migrating into this talks page. If you want to share radical new ways of migrating or hacks or anything like that that you've written an article about, given a presentation on, or created a class for. And we also have a consulting page. We really want to encourage you to use consultants if you need them. There are lots of different types of consultants, and some are tutorials, like Sam Juline's class, which is a 200 plus tutorial class. Others are like Narwhal that will help you with your larger application. 
When you need consultants, reach out to them, and consultants can post information here on what they do and how they can help you. So let's talk a little bit about the different migration paths that I mentioned. Incremental migration is a step-by-step -step process. You take one part of your AngularJS application, bring it to Angular, and now you're up one step. And you continue doing that and doing that until your entire application is now an Angular application. Some of the ways that we use incremental migration is by providing a hybrid application where you're hosting AngularJS and Angular at the same time. You can convert old AngularJS features while creating new Angular features. And this approach is really great for medium to large applications and large teams because you can't just drop everything and start fresh. You might need to be able to continue having that application exist, and so you want to be able to continue building new features. Some of the incremental migration approaches out there today are Angular Elements, which Aaron Coughlin talked about yesterday, NG Upgrade, which Sam Julien talked about yesterday as well, and hybrid routing. Hybrid routing is essentially having two applications, one hosted by AngularJS and one hosted by Angular. So Angular Elements is essentially a bottom-up approach. You use a custom HTML element that's automatically bootstrapped, and this is a framework agnostic approach so that you then wrap it with an Angular component. NG Upgrade provides a hybrid application, again, where you're hosting AngularJS and Angular at the same time. You use the NG Upgrade module, which then can allow your applications to interoperate seamless seamlessly. And routing, or otherwise known as a hybrid routing approach, is where you can use the built-in Angular and AngularJS routers or UI router. And it is always considered the very last step in your migration approach so that you have converted everything from AngularJS to Angular and you no longer need to support the AngularJS framework. So Big Bang migration is kind of an all-at-once migration. As Sam Julien says, you have to kind of burn it all to the ground and then start new. You allow that AngularJS application to grow from all of those ideas that you've always wanted to use. It's a fresh start. You can finally use new techniques. You're not strapped with that AngularJS application anymore. Especially if your application is riddled with bad practices, you can kind of leave it in the dust and start with this fancy new framework. This approach is really great for small applications. Now I want to apply these principles that we've just talked about and discover kind of which migration approach fits your project. So yesterday, as I've spoken several times, Sam Julien gave a presentation on NG Upgrade and how it can save you time and money. And I really want to reiterate the points that he made because they are very fundamental to how they improve your migration approach. So you need to assess your team's size, capacity, and experience when deciding which migration approach is right for you. You want to also assess your project architecture, dependencies, and build process. And these two sectors compiled together help determine which migration approach can fit your team and your project. So when do we use Angular Elements? If you're a large team, I recommend using Angular Elements because it allows you to build features really quickly. If you have an enormous code base, which is roughly 200,000 lines or more, that's kind of a guess, then you're probably too large to burn it all down to the ground and start again. If you have a complex build system, you're probably going to want to use Angular Elements. And if your app is built entirely in AngularJS and you are really ready to use Angular, then start using Angular Elements. Some advocates that we have for Angular Elements are Aaron Coughlin and Narwhal. These two people, Aaron Coughlin and then Victor Savkin and Jeff Cross, really emphasize that Angular Elements can get you off the ground quickly with starting to use Angular. 
So I want to recap a little bit about what Erin talked about yesterday, because she mentioned some very important points. And Angular Elements is kind of relatively new, and it's not that well documented yet, though we have good documentation in um, Angular.io, but not a ton of people have actually started using it. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't. So three of the main points that Aaron covered is that Angular Elements are custom HTML elements. This allows you to approach it in a framework agnostic way so that you don't have to have this ferocious in-depth knowledge of Angular, but you can actually start building applications and building uh, components quickly. You want to think of components as a black box containment where your, where your dependencies and your data are contained within the component. And finally, we want you to try it. There are more and more teams trying it every single day, and they're seeing lots of successes and lots of rapid successes with using Angular Elements. Don't be afraid to try it, because I guarantee you it's a little bit easier than what you actually think. So when should you use ng-upgrade? If you're a small to medium-sized team, ng-upgrade might be right for you. If you have an average code base of around 50,000 lines, ng-upgrade could be right for you. If you have around over 100 components, that means that you have a relatively complex application. And if you have some AngularJS or some Angular in your application, then ng-upgrade can help you build that hybrid application that you might be looking for. Some advocates and proponents of ng-upgrade are Sam Julien. He has this amazing course called Upgrading AngularJS that identifies every aspect of how you can migrate using ng-upgrade. And when should we rewrite from scratch? This is a great approach for tiny to small independent teams or projects. If you have a code base of around 3,000 to 5,000, roughly around there, lines, it means you have a relatively small project and you might be able to kind of burn it down and start new. Again, if you are riddled with tons of bad practices because you kind of went wild with AngularJS, because it was that way, um, then you might want to start with new standardized techniques and start with a better application. So I want to encourage you guys to participate in this community because it is an amazing community. You guys are all there to help each other and lots of people have actually built tools that probably solve the problems you are already facing with migrating. They're just not publicized enough. And so that's why you can go to the forum that's at this QR code or at the URL and find out different tools that can help you migrate. You can publish new information that you have on migrating. If you've created an awesome open source tool that you think the world could benefit from, publish it here. If you want to have your, an your questions answered, publish it here. If you want to read about the general migration pro uh, processes, come here. If you want to use ng Migration Assistant, also here. So I highly recommend utilizing this forum. It, again, is community driven. So if you have something to share, something to say, you can do this. You can post it up there. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. That was brilliant. Um, just a, a few minutes break now, and then we'll, we'll be up and going again very shortly. Thank you.
Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Um, I'm very excited to announce the next two uh, onto stage. We've got Uri Shaked, and this is in his fourth year coming to Angular Connect. He's spoken at every Angular Connect uh, ever. And we also have Kapuna Hele, which is a fun name to pronounce. And uh, she's uh, a native Hawaiian and likes to dance the native H Hawaiian hula. I'd like to see that. OK, so uh, please give him a very warm welcome onto stage. <laughs> Has anyone seen my partner? Uri? Where are you? Oh, there you are. Uri. Huh? What's up? Uh, I'm trying to figure there is an issue with one of my apps, something with the pencil injection. Oh, you know we have our talk. Right. Now. Oh, wow, it's now. I, I totally forgot about it. I was so deep into the code. That happens to me all the time. Um, but can I get a few more minutes just to fix this, to commit? Well, why don't you come up here and work on it together? All right, sounds like a good idea. Great. Right. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Kapuna Heli Wong, and I live in Richmond, Virginia, and I help out on the Angular docs. Ah, wow. Thank you, Kapuna Heli. Well, um, so, yeah, let me just uh, commit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, uh, I will remove this. All right. So yeah, so uh, I'm Huri, I'm hearing a T-Rex hat, I have a bug in my app, uh, and I also write a blog for Angular in Depth. Any fans of Angular in Depth? Cool, you are all my fans. Thank you. And uh, I also work part-time for BlackBerry. Yes, they still exist. <laughs> so let's talk about climbing up injector trees. Right, injector trees, what are these? That's a very good question. <laughs> what is an injector tree? Well, luckily it doesn't have anything to do with needles or real trees. It's the way services get around in your app. Like, I know I define my services in my ng modules and then use them in my component. Isn't it supposed to be that way? Well, that's a way. Let's talk about uh, the basics. You can provide services via ng modules or components. So ng modules, that's what I do, but I didn't know you can also provide them via components. Isn't that cool? Is that a thing now? Yeah. All cool. right. I'm curious. All right. So let's take a look at this. You can provide your services and modules in the ng module decorator using the providers array. And here we've provided a kingdom service. Right, that's what they do. And uh, wait, wait, wait a second. I recognize this. They provided in was something new in Angular 6, right? Yes. But I still don't use it in my app. Am I the only one? <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> so why, wh what's the advantage of this method? Tree shaking. <laughs> Tree shaking. <laughs> So basically, it allows um, Angular to eliminate services that I don't use, right? That's right. Tree shaking, dead code elimination, yeah. ivy. So, and then you use it in your component. Right, that's what I already do. Mm -hmm. So we just injected it here in the constructor. Yeah, that's what I do for a living. <laughs> Should we build this out? Yeah, let's okay. stack blades, interesting. So I'm just going to generate a, an Angular app. So you just created an Angular app like in three seconds. That's amazing. Isn't that great? OK, so let's generate a new service. You can use the ng generate from within stack blades. Neato, right? It's getting cool every moment. I think like in five years, we'll be just like the dinosaurs extinct. <laughs> the code will be <laughs> written for us. OK, so the first thing, I've just generated a kingdom service here. And let's give it a name. Right. How would we call our kingdom? Kingdom, that sounds magical. Mm. How about we use an emoji? I love emojis. A T-Rex that goes with my hat. It goes. Let's go for it. All right. So then the next thing we need to do is head over to our app component. And I have some handy dandy snippets ready. And let's import our service. Oh, so you came prepared. You have snippets. Yeah, That's isn't cool. You know your job. <laughs> I practiced um, a little. All right, so we are in importing, and let me guess, we are now going to inject it into the app component, and then we are going to use it somewhere, probably. Um, yeah, so we are injecting it. 
And so we need now, to, yeah. let me not hide the screen so they can also see it. Okay. Uh, so let's start the editing and see some magic happen. Uh, it is magic. It updates. Wow. Um, so right now we are just printing the kingdom, and that would print T-Rex because we said the name of kingdom to T-Rex. No, oh, uh, apparently with the upper letter K. Uh. I won't, I don't know why. Autocomplete doesn't also get it right, always. Anyway, so yeah, so that's basically what I already know. We define components in the services, and we define services in the modules, and then inject them into components. Uh, at least it's not filter filter anymore. Um, and then that's what I already know, but I thought there is more to it. Yeah, you can define them in a, inside of your component. So let's go over here and try that out. Right, you mentioned we can do it also inside components, so how would that work? Well, let's go right over here and use our providers array. So we basically provide a new kingdom service in the app component, and I guess that the value you are going to put here will override the one we defined in the original service. Mm -hmm. So let's pick a new icon. What do you think? A brontosaurus, of course. We are in a dinosaur conference. Of course. Ready? Yay! So basically, you just define a new value for kingdom service here and then use it within the same component. So it's cool that you can do that, but what's the advantage of that? What's the use case for that? Well, should we try making a child component? I love this generator, so yeah, let's use it as much as we can in this talk. Okay, what should we call it? Uh, I don't know. Mushroom? Have you had mushrooms for breakfast? <laughs> Not today. Right, mushroom. <laughs> I like mushrooms. Okay. So let's import. So let me guess, import, and now we are going to inject it. That's right. And then we are going to print the value of it in yes, the template. Like exactly. Uh, so we head back over to the, the template here, and we're going to use app. App mushroom. mushroom. So we're going to use it, a child component. So mushroom works, it right? Works, great. So let's put some stuff in there. So we are going to put a mushroom oh, emoji, mushroom obviously, because emoji. this is a mushroom component. So mushroom lives in the kingdom. In which kingdom does it live? So it could be either either a brontosaurus. It is a brontosaurus. You're, you just gave away the answer, just I like didn't that. Answer. No, no, no. <laughs> um, so yes. Yeah, so basically, what I see is that the kingdom you provided in the app component also affect the child component. So it basically gives us a way to communicate between components or directive that lives inside the same DOM tree. So a parent component can affect the child components and all the descendants this way. That's right. Interesting. So we defined our service inside of our component. And you, when you provide services in a component, they're available to their child components. Right, that's cool. I yeah. didn't know you can do that. And you have a child and parent, so this is where the tree comes into place, into play, right? That's right. So let's look at this diagram. So this is what we were just looking at, our app mushroom. And the injector was looking for the kingdom service. And it couldn't find it in app mushroom, so it had to continue on up the element injector tree, where it found the brontosaurus. Right, so that's the element injector tree. And I think you mentioned, uh, so we started with modules, right? So there is also something with modules tree? Yes, that's right. So we have ng modules and we have components. So right. What's the difference? Different injector trees. So there are two injector trees. Yes, there's the element injector, which is created by a component or directive, and Angular looks at elements as they appear in the DOM. And then there's the module injector, which is created from ng module from the ng module declaration. Right, and we have seen how the element injector works. But I wonder, in my app where I have this problem, I'm actually using content projection. And while it seems pretty straightforward when you have a child and a parent component, how does it work when you project something into your child components? Well, let's check it out. So. Let's First, remember that these are two separate trees. So for content projection, right now we have in our little app, our app component, and then we have its child component, app mushroom. Mm -hmm. So we're going to create a forest component. We're going to also um, project some content, and we're going to include another 
uh, at mushroom. Because mushrooms grow in the forest. That makes yes, total sense that to makes me. Sense, right? All right, so we'll have the up component inside a mushroom co a forest component, and the up component will project a mushroom into the forest component. That's right. so magical. Let's do this. Let's do it. So okay. uh, I think we need the new forest component first, right? Yes. So let's generate a new forest component. Maybe we should put some dinosaurs in the forest. Dinosaurs. <laughs> All right, and then let me guess. Oh, well, I have some styles I want to. You are going to style it, so it won't be the vanilla white. That's right. Cool. Okay, and then in our forest, let's yeah. get some content, and we'll say this is the forest. So this is the forest of kingdom name. We are going to print the kingdom name, and let me guess. You are now going to import the forest service into the forest, the kingdom service into the forest and inject it like we... Exactly, exactly. So start seeing a pattern here. There is a pattern. It's all pattern. So... Oh, sorry. Um, and then I guess what we would see is basically that the forest is in the uh, kingdom of the brontosaurus because that's what we define in the up component, and it will be a child of the up component. Yep, that makes sense. Oh, and you made it green. Made Thank it you green. for the styling. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, so uh, how does it work with the content projection? So let's go back over here. Oops, right, right, over the template, over and the template. and let's give ourselves another div with a class of projected to use those styles. Oh, that's clever. So you are going to put uh, the projected content inside the white rectangle, so it will be very easier for us, very easy to, for us to see which content comes from the app component. Exactly. Okay. All right. So I have this already. And cool. And we can head back over to our app component. So now we are going to the app component, and we are going to project the content into the forest, right? To say inside the forest component. So this will go into the right rectangle. Wow, I love right. how fast this, like it's real live coding. Okay. Um, and then we have the mushroom. And all right, it, it makes sense. Everything lives in the Brontosaurus kingdom because that's what we defined in the app component. And that's like the parent of all these components. But I will wonder what happens if we provide a different kingdom for the forest, will it affect the stuff inside the rectangle? Wow. Well, what, what do you think? What, uh, let, let's, let's provide um, a different value for the kingdom in this. Which value are we going to use? Oh, I'm getting a little hungry. Another emoji? How about? <laughs> a snippet. Yes. All right, what do we have here? about pizza? It makes sense with the mushroom, so yeah, let's go for pizza. So what do you guys think? As soon as Capunahela will uncomment this line, are we going to see, we're obviously going to see a pizza um, in the granular rectangle, this is the forest, because we define it in the forest, but in the projected content, which comes from the up component template, are we going to see a brontosaur or a pizza? Who thinks pizza? Who thinks brontosaurs? Okay. I really admire the brave guy that voted for pizza. Who is hungry? <laughs> In a few minutes. So <laughs> let's see. Show us the solution. Uh -huh. So both pizza and so everybody was right. Cool. It's both pizza, pizza and a brontosaurus. But why is that? Why do we get one of them is a brontosaurus and the other one is pizza? How well, does that work? Let's take a look at the app component template. Yeah, that was unexpected. So here we have our kingdom name. Right. And kingdom name here. These are both coming from the app component where we right. have Right, so source. basically we created the app component and an instance of this class was created and th these two values are just coming from the same instance of the class. So it's the same property from the same instance of the class. So it made, makes sense that they will have the same value, like they both will be a brontosaurus. Um, but then what about the app mushroom? It's defined in the app component template, and the app component is 
a brontosaurus, so why did it get a pizza? So this app mushroom is the child component of app forest. So it looks up to app forest, or the injector looks up to app forest to find the value. You know what? I want to have a pizza now. Well, there you go. <laughs> the eyes. Yeah. <laughs> OK, so our app mushroom needed a kingdom service, but the injector didn't find it there. So it had to head up the element injector tree to App Forest, where it found pizza. So it just stopped looking. It didn't have to go any further. All right, I think I'm getting it. So basically, it doesn't look at a template. It looks at the DOM that was created as a result of rendering this template. And in this DOM tree, App Mushroom is actually a child of App Forest. And that's why it looks there and find the pizza. It doesn't matter where, in which template it was defined. It matters where it ended up being, which is inside the App Forest. Hmm. You're a smart yeah. cookie. Cookie? Is that an expression? Smart, yeah, cookie? smart cookie. I think you're just trying to tease me with the food. <laughs> it's a cookie. <laughs> OK. So yeah, right, module injectors. So we saw the element injector tree. And when we started, we defined the kingdom service in our module. Uh, but you said there is also a tree there. How, how, how does that work? Let's play with modules and find out. All right. Okay. I like this approach. All right, so let's get rid of this stuff, because we don't need that now. Uh, my favorite thing to do to delete code. <laughs> Then we need to get rid of this provider Just after thread. coping stuff from Stack Overflow. That's second on my list. <laughs> and then we need to create a new module. Yay, generator again. What will we call the new module? Flowers. Flowers go well with the forest. And they don't make me hungry. Mm -hmm. So that's good. Um, and I guess we want to have some component. Oh, we are going to import it to the app module so we can use it. So. Uh, I bet you got a snippet for that as well. Snippets for everything. Oh, you import. Oh, sorry, wrong one. Um, too many snippets. No, I know. Um, yeah, let's start next time. Just do like Shai did with the brain reading, so you don't have to code. <laughs> um, okay, and then we need to. All go right, here. so we have the flowers module, and we are going to generate a component inside it, so we can see what happens. Uh, how would Daisy? Or Daisy right? work? It's Daisy works. It's a flower. Let's do Daisy. Okay, so first we need to import. Yeah, so we are going to import the Kingdom service, right? And then inject it, and then print the value. Oops. Don't get too excited get about so excited. the path. So excited! Okay. I'm so excited. I just can't. Oh, this is copyrighted. We can't see oh, it here. All right, so uh, yeah, and I guess now we are going to print it in the Daisy Works. Like, which kingdom will the Daisy belong to? Uh, How about um, this emoji? It's a sunflower. You know that. I do, I do. But let's let's make it be a, a Daisy for today. All right, okay. that's kind of a crazy Daisy. All right, uh, Daisy lives in D. We are going to own in all the English <laughs> in D kingdom. Shalt it do? Um, yeah, so we have a, a Daisy, and it lives in kingdom name. So I guess if we put it in the app, it will print T-Rex, because we defined uh, Oh, a, that's right. It's not a known element. Let's see. You defined the component, but you forgot to do something, I think. Mm. Do you know what she forgot to do? Nobody? We have like, I mean, why do, do your bosses pay you <laughs> if you don't know that? I'll give you a um, hint. Yeah. It's in here. Yeah, so she defined it in the flowers module, but she had to export it so she could use it in other modules. Don't worry, I always fall for that. It's, uh, yeah, so now we got something in the console, or is it just stack blitz? Yeah, I think it's just stack blitz uh, being slow. Um, let's try uh, this magic button. I don't know if it's going to work, or perhaps we are out of the internet. Starting dev server. 
Okay, so we have the exports and we import it. And this has nothing to do. So basically, AppDaisy is not recognized as a component. Do we forget that module? App, app module? Oh, that's right, yes. Thank you. Right, oh, we yeah, need yeah. to import yeah. it. You are brilliant. Thank you so Yay. much. Claps to you. Yay. Oh, <laughs> and we got a PPP as a bonus. <laughs> okay. So. So yeah, so right now we see that uh, everything lives in the T-Rex um, kingdom, but what happens if we define a different kingdom for the flowers module? What do you think? Let's define a different kingdom. Let's provide some other value for the kingdom service here and see what happens. Hmm, I wonder, uh, which value are you, uh, which kingdom are we going to do now? Hmm, something that has to do with flowers. How about men wrestling? That's weird. <laughs> Let's go for it. All right. <laughs> Works for me. So yeah, so as soon as we uncomment this line, I guess that we will see two T-Rexes. And then since the uh, daisy is inside the flowers, and flowers is going to provide uh, men wrestling, I guess we'll get men wrestling here, right? Yeah. Ready? Yes, I am ready. I was born. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's such an anticlimax. <laughs> All right, okay. and another anticlimax, like what? nothing happened. Did we have, did, did we miss something? We didn't miss anything. If we go over to the app module, and we'll, we'll see here that we're providing the kingdom service. Right. The kingdom service. T-Rex. Right, has the T-Rex, right? But we also provided it in the flowers module. Exactly, we, repro we provided it in two modules. And so when you do that, the parent module will take precedence. Hmm. Well, so if we remove it from the app module, what, what happens then? Ta-da! Interesting. So it seems like both modules have a, one injector, like they converge all the definitions into one injector. Um, and then for the service, it means that... That means there can only be one. Ooh. Oh, deep. Right? Yeah, but then I, I ask myself a question. If it works that way, then where the module injector tree, like, where does it exist? Well, would you like to try adding lazy loading? I like this. This, this is cute? so cute. Thank you for putting it on the slide. You're welcome. Yeah, I feel like him right now. <laughs> No, that was a T-Rex. Uh, um, all right, so what happens when we do lazy loading? Well, does it change anything? Well, would you like to give it a try? Yeah, go ahead. You, you, you help yourself. All these people, everyone's okay. But I'm on stage. I know. Do you want me to live go this? And <laughs> you have seen what happened before when we forgot to import, and this is lazy loading. It's okay, we've got this. Okay, I have, I will, I will I have snippets. Oh, you have snippets, right, right. So I'm all set. So let's see. So we go to the flowers module and we want to make it lazy. So in order to do that, we first need, I hope you really hope you got a snippet for that. We hope we need to import the router module um, because that's how we make modules lazy using the router. And then we need to import it into our uh, ng module and provide it the raw definition, which basically says, what did you write in the snippet? Okay, so whenever this module is lazily loaded, we simply load the daisy component. So whenever this model goes lazy, we load the daisy on a day so hazy to make injector go crazy. Yeah! <laughs> on stage poetry. All right, and then next um, we go to the app module and we use the snippet again. We also need a router, so many imports. Uh, we also need a router module here. Actually, we are in the UK, so should we say router module instead? 
We also import, uh, define the routes for the router module in the UK. So basically, whenever um, we go to slash flowers pass, we want it to lazily load the flowers module. Um, and then we don't need it on the import list anymore. It was so tough to find that we needed it. Uh, and back we are. Updates is not known element. What do we do now? I think you probably need to use that router and head over to the template. Right, so uh, since we now lazy load the daisy component, um, we need to uh, display it using the router or router. Um, and for that, I see you got a button snippet. We have um, two buttons. One button will take us to the flowers module, and the other one will take us back to the um, app component module. And then we have a router outlet. So as soon as I hit the load flowers module, um, the daisy component will be displayed here because the flowers module will be loaded lazy, which will cause to display the daisy. Um, so, and the daisy will tell the name of the kingdom. And what would that name be? What do you think? A T-Rex or a man wrestling? T-Rex? Man wrestling? So if you already know, why did you come to our talk? <laughs> No, actually, it resulted in an error. Yeah, yes, 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 yes. Uncode. A typo? Typo in the? Flopwares. <laughs> I should have guessed we shouldn't flopwares. All right, thank you. Thank you for that. I really admire you. So we are going to, but you already know the answer. So do the drum wall just to make a drama. And another error, yeah. <laughs> so, another? yeah, I don't know why. Uh, we probably have another typo here, but I think this um, also means that uh, you already know the answer. It would show the men wrestling. And luckily, we got it covered in the slide, so. Yes. So if you have just feature modules that are eagerly loaded, you'll have one injector. But if you're using lazy That's load, what we did at first. That's right. And then when we lazy loaded our modules, we would get a new injector for each one of them. That's those. what we try to do now. Now do try it at home. <laughs> so uh, the injector looked up the element injector into the element injector tree first, where the daisy was for the kingdom service, but it didn't find it. Yeah, right, because we removed all the um, injectors, like all the providers from the components. That's right. So then it had to go over to the module injector tree to look for the kingdom service, where it should have found our men wrestling. But it didn't. It didn't, right? Yeah. And but what if there was no men wrestling defined there? Like, what if we didn't provide kingdom in the flowers module? Then the injector would have to continue up the module injector tree. So this is where the module injector tree comes into play, when you have lazy loading, and only when you have lazy loading. <laughs> so basically what, what I can take from here is that we have an element injector, which we search first going up, and then if we don't find a dependency there, we look at the module, the lazy module, where the component was defined, and when we start looking from there, going up the module tree. That's right. So there's a search order. First, we go through the element injector tree. In case of lazy loading, like you just said, the module injector tree. That's what I've just said. You got it. Thank you. <laughs> so, oh, takeaways, yeah. What, what do we want you to take away from here? Pizza and? That there are two injector trees. Yeah, so there are two injector trees, but I think the more important takeaway is how Kapuna Hela and, ha and I were exploring this. Like, when we prepared the talk, we knew there were injector trees because Mishko told us about us, but we had no idea how they worked, and we started reading the documentation, but apparently we found it much easier to go into Stack Blitz, create a new Angular app, start doing crazy things, getting error messages, and as you all proved, you know how to fix those error messages. Don't use flopwares, use flowers. <laughs> it's easy. <laughs> so go home now. Don't mind the lunch, don't mind the conference. Go no home now, experiment, <laughs> stack blitz, uh, Angular CLI, it's super easy and it's super fun. And when you find something new, just blog about it or come to speak about it. 
And we have a few more resources, um, including a blog post that contains all the examples from the talk. Um, but here is the link to the slides. I'm also going to post it on Twitter in a, in a moment, and you will be able to find everything there. Thanks, everybody. Yay! Yay, we are 30 seconds early, so you have more time for food. <laughs> Thank you. That's brilliant. Um, if you're interested, you can join Jen Ashley from Women in Code. She's hosting a diversity and inclusion lunch, which starts at 12.45. We've got Anna and Sherry, um, who spoke yesterday, also speaking there and doing a bit of a Q&A. Um, if, you, if you'd like to join that, grab some food and then head over there for 12.45. If you actively work on diversion or inclusivity, inclusion at work. It's a great thing to go to if you're just interested in it. It's open to everybody, so please do go along there if you're interested at 12.45. You can go to lunch out both sides of the doors. This side is normally slightly busier, so that side is often f less queuing and faster food.
Check. Oh, yeah. OK. Hello. Welcome back. So we have some really great speakers this afternoon, and I'm excited. But first, we have a minute for shenanigans. Who likes shenanigans? I love you, Joe. OK, so sorry, I've been running. I'm out of breath. OK, so I was talking to Josh, one of the other organizers. He's emceeing in the other track. And I was talking a little trash yesterday. Uh, so he thinks that my crowd would not possibly be louder than his crowd, because apparently the like maniac, you know, acting silly is an American thing. In London, we're like more civilized here. But I want them to know that we have the best crowd, because I told him we were going to have the best crowd. So I want you guys to do me a favor, please, because it makes me happy. On the count of three, I know this might be weird for you guys, but just go with me, because it's going to be fun. And it's going to really aggravate Josh. <laughs> So on the count of three, I want you guys to do me a favor and just like start clapping and screaming and whooping and hollering like maniacs. Will you do this for me? Yeah. Okay, on the count of three, ready? One, two, three. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. Top that, Josh. Okay, uh, are they gonna yell back? I don't even hear them, I don't even hear them at all. We're so awesome. Okay, so uh, now we, uh, are they gonna yell? No, they can't even out yell. First of all, we have a bigger crowd. They can't, he thinks they can out. Okay. They can't hear us? Uh oh, is it on that side or that side? Open the door, will you? You guys, I'm gonna get fired for this. <laughs> can we try again? Will you do it one more time? Okay, ready? Count of three. One, two, three. Look, everybody in the hall is rushing in here. I don't know what's going on, but it's cool, whatever it is. Okay, so uh, I don't even think they can hear us, but that's okay. Okay, so now that we're all hollering, because I love you. You guys are so fun. Y'all are great. Um, I want you to do this one more time, because I'm going to introduce Manfred. And I want you guys to give him a, a big warm welcome. Yeah, thank you and welcome to this talk. This talk is about Angular and architecture. And as mentioned, I am Manfred, I'm a trainer and consultant. I have even a slide for this. And I'm doing a lot of consultancy as well as in-house uh, trainings with companies, mainly in Germany, sometimes in Austria and other parts of Europe. I'm also part of the Google Developer Expert program and I'm quite proud of this. And I want to start, thank you, <laughs> I want to start this presentation with a question. Who of you had ever the pleasure of starting a new project from the scratch? Oh, nice, nice. It's a nice experience. Uh, at least in my uh, past, it was ever a nice experience. At the first day, your project looks like this. It is a green field with all those possibilities. Everything can happen here. And then after some weeks, it looks like this. It is very cute, as you see. It does exactly what it is supposed to do. But after some years, it exactly looks like this guy here. <laughs> and no, this isn't me at college. This is the Frankenstein monster. You know the Frankenstein monster, this monster that was assembled of different body parts of different people. And this is exactly what happens when we don't care about architecture. We are adding one body part after the other one. We are adding one use case after the other one. We are adding several libraries and perhaps frameworks. And maintaining such a system is really difficult. And this is exactly what this talk is about. In this talk, I want to give you three ideas of how to avoid such a Frankenstein monster within your projects. I will start with something that is quite obvious. I will start with NBM packages. And then I will move on to the mono repo repository that is quite common nowadays in the area of Angular development. And as a third point, I will speak about micro apps, micro apps, microservices, micro frontends, as you want to call them. 
And of course at the end I will give you some guidance upon how to choose the right solution for, for your very uh, special needs for your projects and so on. So first things first, let's start with the NBM package approach. The idea behind this is to subdivide a big system into tinier parts. And each part could be an NBM package that is installed on demand and integrated into your overall architecture. And here I have a good message for you, perhaps you have seen it, since about six months using NBM packages, especially creating NBM packages, has been built in into the CLI. Using the CLI 6 and above, it's really easy to do something like this. Everything you do is newing up a new project, and then of course you can move into this project, and in addition to that, and this is the new point, you can create a sub-project. And the sub-project here is a library, a flight booking library that cares about a specific use case in my overall application. In addition to that, you can add further applications. For instance, this playground application here I'm using to test my library. To execute my playground application, I can serve it with this project switch. And then when everything is good, I can actually build my library. And this is creating everything you need to publish something using an NBM registry, like the registry out there, or a registry that is installed in your company. And for publishing your stuff, you know, you can just leverage this NBM publish command. You will, for instance, append your company internal registry for this. It is really nowadays as simple as that. In former days, it was a bit more complicated. And this way of subdividing a project have several advantages. One advantage is you can easily distribute your source code amongst your colleagues. You just publish it to the NBM registry and your colleagues can make use of it. Another advantage is you're getting versioning out of the box. Every time you publish your package, you have to assign a new version. And so your customers can decide upon whether to go with the current version or with an older version for reasons of compatibility, for instance. Those are the advantages. But of course, there are also some disadvantages and I have placed those disadvantages on the next slide. You can find them here. So, as it turns out, all those advantages are also disadvantages. Let me elaborate a bit about this. When it comes to distribution, it is somehow annoying when you have to distribute your source code within one project using an NBM registry. Just imagine how this would look like. First of all, as the library developer, you would implement your library. You would assign a new version, you would test it, and after this you would publish it to the NBM registry. And then you are changing the role, then you are the application developer, you would NBM install the package, you would integrate the package into your application, and of course you will find a bug, won't you? And then one more time you have to switch roles, you are the library author again, you will uh, fix the bug, you will publish a new version, and so on and so forth. So, as you have seen in this little roleplay, it is really annoying to use an NBM registry within one project. Another advantage that could be a disadvantage is versioning. Because versioning means that there are old versions out there. And this means you can have version conflicts. And somehow, especially when it just comes to one project, you want to force everyone into using the newest version. This is not necessarily true when you want to share your source code with other projects, but when it comes to one big project, everyone should normally use the same, exactly the same version. And this is exactly where the second approach comes in I want to talk about today. The second approach is called a monorepo approach, or to say it's more precise, monorepos. 
A monorepo is just a folder structure like this that is checked into your source control. And as you see here, you have a big projects folder, and this projects folder contains a lot of sub-projects. Each and every sub-project goes in one of those subfolders here. That means everything is put together. The best thing about this monorepo approach is that you have this node modules folder here. You have only one of those node modules folders. That means each and every sub-project is using exactly the same version of your dependencies, exactly the same version of Angular, of Bootstrap, and of all the other dependencies. Just imagine what would happen if you used Angular 5 here and Angular 7 there. And then imagine that you are using those sub-projects together. I guarantee you hell would break loose if this was the case. Here we are good, we are, here we are on the safe side, because we are forced into using exactly the same versions of all dependencies. And this is the first advantage I have here. Everyone uses the latest versions, but not only of your dependencies, but also of your other projects, because the other projects, the other sub-projects, are just in the folder next to yours. You just have to do something like, you know, point, point, slash, project name, slash, this file, or that file, and you get the newest stuff from the other parts of your software. And of course, as mentioned, we don't end up having version conflicts. Another advantage is you don't have the burden of distributing libraries. You just need to create a new folder, and that's it. That's really a piece of cake, if you ask me. And there is a lot of experience out there with this approach. Google is using it quite heavily. Facebook is also using it quite heavily. And in some areas of software development, it is also the default solution for about two decades. Who of you is using .NET or Visual Studio? Yeah, some of you. In this case, you know this solution. Uh, the world of .NET is calling this a Visual Studio solution, which is nothing else than a big folder that contains sub-projects belonging together. Or who of you had to use Eclipse so far? Yeah, some of you. Also in Eclipse there is the notation of a workspace, which is just a big folder with sub-projects. The best thing about this monorepo approach is that it isn't a one-way street. You can move back and forth very easily. Just imagine this here is your mono repository, a quite simple mono repository. And let's say the source code here is quite major. We've worked on this for half a year or something like that. When you wanted to share your validation library with the rest of the world or with other project teams, you could very easily take it out and put it as an NPM module into an NPM registry. And doing so, other project teams or even other people around the world could make use of it. To be honest, this is exactly how Angular is built. They are building Angular within a mono repository. That means they are testing everything together. This makes sure that Angular 6 works seamlessly with Angular Form 6 and Angular Common 6 and Angular Core 6 and Angular Router 6 and so on and so forth. And when they are done, they just publish it to an NPM registry for the rest of us and we are then just uh, NPM installing it. So you have all the possibilities, even though you are starting with a monorepo structure. If you like this idea of the monorepo, I want to encourage you to have a look at NX. NX is what I'm calling the sugar dip on top of the Angular CLI. NX is extending the Angular CLI with very nice additional features, and most of them are quite in handy when it comes to monorepos. I want you just to see one of those features. One of them is a possibility to display your project structure in a graphical way. 
That means you can display which subproject is accessing which other subprojects. And this is quite important when you want to prevent this Frankenstein monster. Because when each and every library of your system is accessing each and every other library, you have a mess, you have a big ball of mud. Because in this case, you cannot exchange anything because everything else depends on it. It is just one feature that helps with monorepos within this noble NX toolkit. So we now have a lot of advantages. We don't have the burden with distributing libraries. We don't end up with version conflicts. And we finally managed to subdivide a big project into tiny parts. This is the advantage, but there are also some disadvantages. And you will find them one more time on the next slide. You will find them here. So one more time, it turns out that all those advantages are also disadvantages. Because having a lot of subprojects is also a disadvantage when they talk to each other. And normally they do. And talking to each other is an issue because every time one component of your system talks to another part of the system, you are creating a contract. And contracts are hard to change. If you don't believe me, just try it out in the next break. Just try to change your renting contract immediately or your marriage contract. You will find out it is not easy at all. Changing a contract involves a lot of discussions. It uh, uh, involves finding new solutions and perhaps you have to find an intermediate solution. It also takes some time to get there to adopt the real world to the new solution in the new contract. So somehow this is a pity. This is especially a pity when you have several teams because that means those teams need to coordinate each other. And that means they have to do a lot of meetings and sometimes you have the impression that you are spending more time with meetings than with producing source code. And you know it, in big companies this very often ends up in political discussions. It is very often about company politics. Another thing you are decreasing here is maintainability. You cannot easily change something because the other team might depend on it. And that means that you are ending up just with one architecture and just with one framework. And having just one architecture, having just one framework, going with such a one-size-fits-all solution is really a pity when it comes to long-term projects. Especially business projects have to be maintained for 10 or 15 years. And in the course of 10 or 15 years, a lot of things can show up new technologies, new use cases, and perhaps you need a completely different architecture for the use case that shows up in seven years. And this approach here, of course, is taking out a lot of flexibility. And this leads me to the third approach I want to speak about today. It's about micro apps. The idea of micro apps is quite simple, and it is everything but new. The idea is not to write a big system. Instead of this, you are writing several tiny systems that don't need to interact with each other. Or if they need to interact, then very seldomly. So you have self-contained systems that can be created by self-contained Ardarchic teams. In the back end, this approach is quite common nowadays. Everyone is speaking about it. They are calling it microservices. When you take this approach and put it to the area of front-end development, you have something like a micro-app or micro-front-ends. This is how we are calling it today. And of course, this brings a lot of advantages. We are minimizing the amount of contracts we have. We can do a separate deployment as well as a separate development in each order. And you can mix and match technologies as well as mix and match architectures. 
Each tiny micro application can have its own technology stack and its own architecture, or to put it in another way, you can use the best technology decisions for each of your tiny applications. And now, of course, the question is how to implement such a thing. And one answer would be, <coughs> one answer would be to go with hyperlinks. This is the simplest approach. And I think hyperlinks are quite a valid solution. I mean, hyperlinks are here for about 20 years. And to be honest, I have never ever heard someone to say a bad word about hyperlinks. In this case, you would end up having several single page applications and they would point to each other by means of hyperlinks. This is something like Google is doing. Of course, as mentioned, Google is using the mono repo approach quite heavily. But besides this, when you look at the Google suite, you have several applications and those applications are dealing with almost one use case. And when you need another use case, when you need another application, you are following links within this menu here. So you could switch over to Google Docs or to Google Sheets and so on and so forth. The advantage of this is it is quite simple, but one disadvantage is you will lose state. Every time you are moving over to another application, you will lose your state. And you need to load a new application, and this is exactly what we wanted to prevent when we've invented single page applications. But as it turns out, for some scenarios like a product suite, it is a good approach and a simple one. By the way, the most important aspect of this whole talk can be seen on this slide here. I'm putting a lot of emphasis into it, namely in Germany, to be more precise, in the country that is called Lower Saxony, it is a federal country of Germany, there is a village called Steierberg. I'm so proud of it, they have my name in it. Is someone here from Lower Saxony? Yeah, I love you people, thank you, you are the greatest, thanks. Cool, so let's go on with the boring stuff, uh, with the technical stuff. When you are doing this approach, then you have something like shared widgets. You have to care about sharing widgets to provide something like a consistent UI. And for this, it would be a nice idea to use something like web components. And guess what? In the area of Angular, we are happy because we have Angular elements and they allow us to provide framework neutral components, components that can be used with each and every framework, even with vanilla jazz. Of course, sometimes hyperlinks are not enough. In those situations, you need to provide a shell a shell that is capable of loading other single page applications on demand. In this case, you will not lose state. What do you think? What is the simplest but also ugliest solution to load one single page application into a shell, which is also a single page application? Iframes, yeah. I don't know about you, but every time I'm hearing the word iframe, I'm getting this strange feeling in the stomach. <laughs> no, just kidding. Sometimes iframes are just the right solution because they allow you to integrate third-party vendor applications. You can even integrate something like, um, like legacy applications let's say PHP applications or ASP.NET applications. They don't need to be single page applications. And they provide a really good amount of isolation. That means the application in the first iframe cannot influence the application in the other iframe. Bugs are isolated as well as the layout cannot influence the other side. Another approach uh, you will find nowadays when searching for this is bootstrapping several single page applications. That means you have one index HTML and you load several bundles with different single page applications into it, hopefully in a lazy manner. Hopefully you will do it using lazy loading. And so one Angular application and one AngularJS application and one VanillaJS application ends up in your browser. And for this I have prepared a demonstration. 
Let's have a look at this. What you see here is just a shell application. It's written with Angular. And the only task of the shell application is loading other self-contained applications into this working area. This is what I'm calling my blue Angular client. I can also load a red Angular client. As you see here on the next step, those applications are really self-contained. They can also run in standalone mode. That means one team can concentrate on this client. It can do its testing. It can do its extensions. It can publish it when it's done. And after publishing, the shell will load the newest version of it into this working area. Let's click to payment. Uh, what's, what happened here? Uh, I promise you, I don't know this logo. I have never seen this logo before. I'm an Angular guy, I promise you. But in my point of view, this <laughs> really shows that we can now mix and max match technologies within one shell application. And perhaps someone of you is still using AngularJS. Who is still using AngularJS 1? OK. So perhaps uh, micro apps are one solution for migrating everything. Here I have wrapped my AngularJS application and I've imported it into my shell. What you're seeing here is what I'm calling the macro architecture, the overall architecture. But of course, when you go to the inside of one application, you have also something like a micro architecture. Micro architecture means you are reusing widgets from other clients to bridge the gap. And as you see here, here I'm using a widget from my green client and a vanilla JS based widget as well as a widget from my blue Angular client. Okay. So this seems to be quite a nice approach and it has some advantages. You're ending up with several small and decoupled projects that can be created with their own technology stack individually. And this is about mixing and matching technologies, not because we want, but because we have to when we think about a software system that needs to evolve over a decade or over a longer time period. We have our dark kick teams. They can work on their own. They are self-contained. And we have a separate development as well as a separate deployment. And the team can have its own decisions. Those are the advantages. And one more time, there are disadvantages. I know, meanwhile, you know this game. Those are the disadvantages. Those are the disadvantages because all those advantages come with the fact that we have to load several bundles into our browser. And that also means those bundles cannot be as optimized as with a monorepo because the bundles are created individually. That means you cannot have something like overall optimizations, like overall tree shaking and so on. And somehow you have to take care about UI consistency. This is also a disadvantage or let's say a challenge you need to solve. Okay. So far, you have seen several approaches to structure a big application to provide this Frankenstein monster. And of course, now the question is, which solution is the best for your very needs? And the answer is, well, it depends. It is really difficult to find the answer. I'm discussing this a lot with different customers. And it is really difficult because, let's be honest, Every one of us just wants to have the advantages. No one of us wants to go with one of those disadvantages. And that's why you will very likely end up in cycles when discussing about something like this. To prevent those cycles, to shorten those discussions a bit, I've created a decision tree. Of course, the decision tree is not the last word on this, but it proved to be in handy to find a first good architectural candidate to find a first good decision. The first question I would ask you is, do you have a lot of shared state? Do you need to share a lot of state between your micro apps? And does the user need to navigate a lot between them? 
if you say no, there is little of this, you have something like a product suite, something like Office 365 or the Google suite. And in this case, just start with tiny single page applications with less complex ones and connect them using hyperlinks. If you say, hey, I have a lot of shared state and users navigate back and forth all the time, the next question is, do you need to integrate legacy applications or do you want to have a very strong isolation because you are integrating third-party vendor applications? And when you say yes, then consider iframes. Of course, you will not win an architectural award with this, but sometimes iframes are the right solution, especially when you have a behind the firewall system. This is not the right solution for a public website. You will not build the next Amazon using iframes, of course. When you say no, I don't need those legacy applications. The next question is, do you need a separate deployment? Or do you even need to mix and match technologies? Do you need autarkic teams? And when you say no, I don't need this stuff, then you would go with the mono repo approach. If you say yes, I need this, then consider bootstrapping several CLIs. If you say, no, I don't need this mixing and matching of technologies, consider mono repositories. So we are coming to the end of this talk. If you say, hey, I've liked this talk, check out my blog. I've written a lot of articles about this. This is currently one of my main topics. And even if you say, hey, this was an awful talk, check out my blog anyway. Perhaps I'm better at writing than at speaking, who knows. Okay, so let me sum up. We have seen we can use packages, NBM packages, to reuse existing source code between several projects. And then we have seen we can go with the mono repo to subdivide a big application into tiny parts. And we have also seen there is this micro app approach and it is about decoupling projects. You get several tiny self-contained projects. For using packages, you can go with the CLI 6. It's baked in now. For using mono repos, you can also go with the CLI 6 as well as with NX of Novel. And for using micro apps, you have several approaches. You could go with hyperlinks like Google. You could use iframes for legacy stuff. You could bootstrap several single page applications. One last thing I want to give you. Please beware the Frankenstein monster within your applications because it leads to a very uh, unmaintainable architecture. So thanks for coming. You will find all my material on my blog. Have a nice day and enjoy the conference. Thank you. <laughs>
Yeah, it's on. Okay. Are you guys ready? I, I have to say, I always feel kind of bad because I feel like I should give the CLI team some of every dollar that I earn because they do half of my work for me. And I love these guys. And just when you think that the CLI like could not possibly be any cooler, uh, apparently they're still working on some new cool stuff. So let's hear about it. Come on, Philippe. Have a clicker. Ah. Hi everyone, um, my name is Philippe Silva. Uh, I work on the CLI team. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, you might have seen me around the CLI uh, issue tracker as the person that initiates pretty much any interaction with the word Heya. Um, so that's me, a bit less hair, but you know. Um, and today I'm here to talk about the state of the CLI, uh, kind of like give you an overview of what we expect. Uh, sometimes what we're working on and what we're, we want to do next is, is not very clear. Um, and I want to shed some light. We just released CLI v7. Um, and the main feature that you can probably see in CLI v7 is prompts. If you have a, a terminal that's a TTY terminal, you can, when I mean, you do ngnu, without putting in a project name, it'll ask you a couple of questions. We think this is a useful feature, and I'll expand on it a bit later. Um, the other thing that we did is to only re load the reflect polyfill on jet builds. This is nice because only jet builds actually need this reflect polyfill in most circumstances, and that shaves up about 20 kilobytes of your production bundle. Uh, then we put the docs on Angular I.O. This has been a bit of a pain point. Uh, our documentation has traditionally built been on the CLI repo inside the wiki. It's not very clear that it's there. People go to AngularIO and they want to know what these commands do. Uh, they can now know this. We, we'll be migrating more and more documentation there, but for now, the commands are there. Uh, we've had a, a, a flag to the builds. You can actually profile the builds, and this is useful when like, you update the CLI and you find, oh, the, like, my build is taking twice as long. Something's wrong. Um, this usually leads to issues being filed on the issue tracker and some back and forth, and I'm trying to tell people this is, this is how you can take profiles. So we added a, uh, a flag to make it easier for you to profile your build and send it over to us so we can look into it. Some, sometimes these performance problems are really hard to diagnose and are very, very project specific. Um, this, this, last, this bit is a bit of a milestone for us. The CLI is now used inside Google. It wasn't before, but now uh, users of Angular inside Google and outside are also doing ngnu, ngbuild, and all of that. Uh, I'll get back to why we want to do this a bit later. And we actually think that the CLI is stable. That's why you don't, you don't see any revolution, revolutionary features here. So. Uh, contrary to what Bonnie was thinking, maybe, maybe we're not actually adding a lot of new stuff to the CLI. Um, we actually think that, well, initially the CLI was meant to, to exist as a single thing, which is we want to make, for the majority of use cases, making an Angular app easy to create, build, maintain, and overall interact with. And I think that for the majority of use cases, this is true right now. There are some exceptions. Um, what we make and what we put, make available as default doesn't actually suit all projects. Sometimes the CLI is just perfect, except for this one small thing. Um, and truth is, we don't want to add flags for each small thing that comes along. We want to actually allow you to do that customization via advanced APIs. One such API is schematics. Um, the CLI is actually a collection of tools. There's be, the CLI started as a, a single big tool, and then we started separating everything that we could separate. And one of the ones that's well separated and that's, that exists on its own right now is Schematics. Uh, we've just released Schematics v7. Uh, schematics is actually what internally powers ngnu, ng-generate, update, and add. Oh. Uh, schematics standalone is also used inside of Google now. And this is the first major release of schematics. Uh, sch before v7, schematics was 0 0.7, and since we like skipping versions a lot, we just make a v made a v7 so everything's coordinated. Uh, but this has a couple of implications. We, we feel now it's stable. At 0.x, it wasn't stable. Uh, it, a lot of people saw the 0.x and thought, this is still experimental. I, I don't want to dip, dip my feet into the water right now because maybe things will change. We're kind of committed to it not changing now. We're committed to to making it a stable thing that you can rely on in production and that you can feel confident going forward with. And 
as I mentioned before, we have prompts. And prompts are actually managed by schematics. I'll give you an example of a prompt that we have today. Uh, this is the prompt, how, how the prompt looks for adding material. And it asks you a couple of basic questions. What's the theme that you want? Do you want to add animations? Do you want to add gesture support? It's, it's, these questions by themselves aren't, don't look very important. But on the context of initial experience, they are very important. This is essentially the getting started part of Angular Material. This is something that if you were doing by hand, making these decisions and copying over the code and adding the fonts, etc., I will say that it will take you roughly 20 minutes to 30 minutes, which, like me saying that getting, for getting started takes that long sounds weird, but consider how long it takes to actually look up these new terms as a new user, how long it takes to actually validate that what you're doing is correct, how long it takes to backtrack when something goes wrong. So that can end up taking a while. And when you just want to try out a new idea, when you just want to, you know, you've thought of something on a Saturday afternoon and you have like two hours where you want to play with it, that the setup takes perhaps one or two minutes instead of 30 minutes is kind of substantial. You just have more time to, to play with what you want to play. No. Um, so what we want to do right now for schematics is to focus on documentation and support. We want to make it easy to use schematics. Uh, our documentation now is not great for schematics. You'll find a lot of blog posts. You'll find a lot of community uh, posts telling how you do this and that. We want to make good first-party documentation for schematics. We want to make it easier for you to create the things that you want to create with schematics and to plug into the CLI using schematics. And the big thing that we're looking for, uh, looking at working at now, is large workspaces. Um, you've probably actually been to a couple of talks where large workspaces or uh, taking care of building monorepos has been a central topic. We think it's a very important topic. We think that the CLI right now does not do that well. Uh, by large workspaces, we mean either one single huge project uh, in which the big problems are something like builds take very long time, or very small projects in which the problems are actually coordinating all of that and managing these projects and making sure everything works the way you want it to. It's important to notice that a big project is not just a small project with a lot more files, uh, in the same way that a skyscraper is not just a tall house. Uh, there is a difference in kind. The support structure you need to actually make these things work and make your team be able to coordinate with, with each other and make all of, these thing, all of these individual projects work together properly is different than on small projects where maybe it's just one or two. And the way that we're trying to address that is by adding, adding opt-in Bazel support. Um, you might have heard the word Bazel a couple of times throughout this conference or maybe other Angular conferences. Bazel is a tool that's used internally at Google. Uh, they use it to coordinate most of what's built at Google. Uh, we want to have this feature as a part of labs. This means that it's very much experimental for now, but as time goes by, it gets more mature, and eventually we release it with full support and full guarantees of stability. Bazel exists as a build coordinator in the context of CLI mostly. This means that it's not that we want to replace, for instance, Webpack, which is what we use behind the hood for builds right now with Bazel, but rather that we want to use Bazel to coordinate a multitude of builds. Maybe we want to coordinate Webpack builds. Maybe we want to coordinate Karma runs. But we want something to be coordinating all of that. And I, I've been talking a bit about how like the CLI is used at Google, schematics is used at Google, and now I'm mentioning something that's used in Google and that we want to put it in the CLI. Um, the reason why I'm, I'm saying that is because at the, at the CLI team, at the tools team, we actually have this vision that we have a confluence of tools. We want to bring the tools that are used inside of Google outside and the tools that are being used outside of Google inside of Google. Um, and bringing Bazel into the CLI is a big part of that. And I want to emphasize that even if you opt into this large workspace support mode, you're still using the CLI. You still do ng build, you still do ng test, ng lint, all of that. Your interaction patterns shouldn't change. Uh, that's, that's kind of why that was part of the original mission of the CLI, that you had this toolkit in which you could do all of these things that perhaps before you did it scripts or you did with multiple commands, etc. We wanted to give you a good interface that you just did one command. And we'd like to do something similar for large workspaces, too. So let's talk about how it 
should look like in the future. Um, I mentioned that the API into hooking into schematics, uh, sorry, the API into looking into the CLI using schematics should allow you some customization. So we're going to use our own customization here. Uh, we'd say that we want to globally install at Angular slash Bazel, and that when we make a new project, we want to use a specific collection, which is the one at, at Angular slash Bazel. This should make a new project using Bazel. This should be coming in 7.x, so it's not here today. If you try to do this today, well, nothing good can happen. Uh, but eventually, this, this is how we plan for it to look like. But if you have an existing project, you can also convert your project. So in, in the example of adding Angular material, what happened is that when you add Angular material, a bunch of your files are changed. Uh, so we try to do that work for you. For instance, we add the styles, we add configuration to angular.json, we add the animations module, we add in, any imports needed, we do all of that. So when adding Bazel, we'd be aiming at doing the same thing. Any configuration in any files that need, would need to be changed, we do that for you so that you could add it and then keep on working as you were working roughly before. And I want to say that I mentioned we wanted to add Bazel to support large workspaces. But there's also benefits in small workspaces. Uh, there's good things about Bazel that you can see even if you opt to use Bazel from the start. One of those benefits is hermeticity. Uh, and this is one that's kind of dear to me. It, I think it's very common that sometimes your project works on your machine and doesn't work on other machines. That's because generally your project depends on stuff that's not just on the project. The most obvious is that it depends on Node. It depends on the Node version that you're using. And it will depend on your package manager, NPM or Yarn. And then when your colleagues have a different version of these things and you run your project on their machine, something different might happen. Maybe the build won't be what won't finish successfully. Maybe you'll see a couple of errors that you didn't see on your machine. But it, almost all projects depend on it a little bit more than that. For instance, if you run your tests locally and you try to run them on, the, on your continuous integration machine, maybe that won't work very well. That's because locally you depend on your local Chrome. And on the CI, maybe Chrome isn't installed. So this hermeticity is actually guaranteed by Bazel. You can have a very strong guarantee that if it's running on your machine, it should run on other machines because Bazel codifies everything that your build actually needs. And hand with, to hand with this is that you actually don't have to set up your environment. Uh, if, if we're downloading packages for NPM, we might have to use NPM, but Bazel will actually install packages separately so that whenever something is running, even if you, if you, even if you forgotten to install your your packages, maybe it will still run because Bazel will just install everything in the background and it will guarantee that everyone that's running this project will be using the same thing. Uh, another thing is that you can debug intermediate files. Mm, I expect that a lot of people here have had cryptic errors on ng factories. And on the CLI, if you see an error on an ng factory, you're kind of out of luck because you, the ng factory isn't anywhere. Um, so you can't debug these things. Things that are left in as intermediate steps are, for instance, files before uglification. You just can't see what's there. But since Bazel actually leaves the intermediate steps around, you'd be able to see them. When we go up to medium-sized workspaces, uh, you start to see a couple more benefits. Build coordination, I think, is really the big one. Um, for instance, if you have one application and one library right now, you have to remember to build the library before you build your application. Uh, and if you forget to build it, then your application won't succeed its build. But in your mind, you, you know, I need to build the library before. Why, why didn't the build system do this for me? But stuff actually gets a bit more complicated when you have several of these. For instance, if you have libraries that depend on one another or applications that depend on multiple libraries, and as this, this dependency graph increases, it's completely impossible to right now just remember to do everything by hand. It's very cumbersome. And this is the main way by which I think Angular integrates really well with the CLI, right? Uh, that Bazel integrates really well with the CLI right now. Um, and since it's actually building this, this graph of what it needs to, to coordinate and build, it will be parallel by default. It knows what's on the critical path, what's not, and everything that can run in parallel. 
you might say that uh, Node does this. Node is single threaded by default, but you can run things in parallel and spawn other processes. But in Bazel, that just, that's just the norm. Now, in medium workspaces, we also have something called incrementality. Uh, you might have seen other talks talk about incrementality, especially in the last year, I believe, which is the idea that the time it takes to effect a change should be proportional to the change, not to the size of the whole project. So, for instance, if you're just changing a little part of your library and your application depends on your library, it's reasonable enough to imagine that both need to be rebuilt. But if you're just changing your application, maybe your library doesn't need to be rebuilt. Or even within your application, if you've just changed the global styles, then why do you actually need to rebuild everything the next time you build? So Bazel can figure out what actually needs to be rebuilt and not just rebuild everything. And another very good thing is that Bazel will cache all builds and tests. It's kind of easy to underestimate how important this is, but as your project grows, you're no longer looking at testing maybe taking one or two minutes. When tests are taking 10 minutes, you start having to adopt certain strategies. Maybe you isolate this, this test that's gonna run. Uh, maybe you actually try not to run most tests unless you really have to. And that, that becomes hard to manage. Uh, with Bazel, you can have this guarantee that only the tests that need to be rerun are actually run. So it's, it's very similar to the build example, that if your library changes, maybe the, it needs to be retested and your application needs to be retested. But surely if your application changes, your library doesn't depend on your application. The library tests don't need to be run again. And when you start getting to large workspaces, the situation gets even better. Uh, the same cache that you can have locally, you can have remotely. What this means in a lot of cases is that however fast things are on your machine, they can also be on your CI. Because you can have like this, this huge library of cached builds and your CI just connects to them and everything that was already cached, it doesn't need to build again. But besides just caching the builds themselves remotely, you can also run them remotely. Um, and this is really a problem on big projects. If your build takes about one hour with your amount of cores, let's be generous and say 16, I don't think it'll take one hour if you have like a thousand cores available. I think a lot of things become really fast when you have a thousand cores available. And when you get these two things together, you have something even better, which is no build needs to be run more than once if, if it hasn't actually changed. So imagine that you get to the office uh, Tuesday morning, someone made huge changes Monday afternoon. The first time that someone actually orders a build, everything will be cached. The second person will get the cached results. So these builds don't actually need to be rerun. Something that would take one hour per team member suddenly doesn't. It takes like one hour and maybe like a couple of minutes for the others to fetch the results. And something that also happens as projects grow is that they start using more than one language um, and more than one build system. If you have a library right now, it might not be apparent, but the build system for your library is not the same as the build system for your application. They're slightly different. They support slightly different things. Uh, but going forward, if you have, for instance, a server, maybe your server is not actually written in JavaScript, maybe it's written in Go. And having multiple languages being built on the same workspace, is, is, it's not trivial. Uh, you have to have like different build setups for each of them, and you have to coordinate uh, building of different languages. And actually, Bazel is really good at that. It, it doesn't really care what it's, what it's building as long as it's shown how to build it. The last thing is, I, I think most will think rather minor, but for me, as, as someone that spends a lot of time in tooling, is, is actually rather major. Um, being able to debug directly in the source. Sometimes you have to pull in other projects, and this, this happens a lot in the NPM ecosystem, that their repositories are, for instance, in TypeScript. So their project needs to be built before you can actually choose a change that you need there. So for instance, imagine that your server is bugged and you actually have a, uh, a, a server in some other repository. Uh, in projects that use Bazel, you can make, make dependencies to directly to the source. So you can make dependencies to sources that you control and also if they also use Bazel sources that you don't control. 
And then their whole build system is again codified. You don't need to set up any environment. You don't need to do anything else. You can just go directly into, your, into their source, make some kind of change, and see how that affects your project. And that's, that's really hard to do with pretty much anything outside Bazel. Anyone that has tried to compile a NPM package that needs any kind of build step or is even a mono repo and then bring the results over to yours, you probably had some difficulties doing that. So, although I said that this doesn't exist yet, we do have a demo. It's a very experimental demo. This demo has two labs icons to show that it's extra experimental, but it's kind of like twice experimental. It's, you, but you can try it right now. It will more work mostly on Windows. So, for instance, I think that the normal serve doesn't work, but the production serve does work, and it will fully work on both OS X and Linux. Uh, so this is something that you can go check out right now. You just clone the repository, get into the folder, run yarn, and then run ng-serve, and something will come up. And this is a good example. The same commands were used, but the build system, what's underneath, was different, and things were coordinated in a different way. Uh, so I encourage you to go test this. I don't really encourage you to submit issues because it's, again, very experimental. If it doesn't work on your setup, we really want it to work, uh, but it's something that we're going to be iterating a lot, a lot. Uh, over the next months. And I finished a bit earlier. Um, I hope that you have you know, some more time to talk to each other and, uh, and enjoy the space. But thank you for coming and thank you for listening to this talk. Okay, here, are we, are we ready, Joe, for right now? Or we have a, okay, guys, we have a five minute break, and then we have Olivier Coleman. You do not want to miss that talk. So we'll see you in five minutes. We also have, what do we have? Track two, Sonny Youssef. You're going up against Sonny, Olivier. I think, I think that's, that's, those are, that's a hard choice. Those are both really good talks. It's a good thing they're on YouTube. Okay, so we'll see you guys in five minutes for Olivier. All right, I have to thank Ander because he just reminded me of a super important announcement that I totally forgot about. Uh, so we're going to have an Angular panel at the end of the day, and you can submit questions for the Angular panel. And in order to do that, you go to uh, Slido, 
S-L-I dot D-O. And then you're going to put in the code Angular Connect, all one word, all lowercase, and click on Angular Panel, and that's where you can submit questions that the Angular Panel will will answer later on. So if you guys go on there and put your questions, and I know everybody, <laughs> we should like all ask them. Hey, when's Ivy going to be ready? <laughs> I get a kick out of myself. Okay, so uh, as S-L-I dot D-O, and the code is Angular Connect. Click on Angular Panel, and you can put in questions there. Thank you, Andre, for reminding me. That was awesome.
All right, all right, all right. Are you guys ready to get started again? I know, okay, one more time I have to say, uh, we have an Angular panel coming up. Every time I start running, I get out of breath. I'm so out of shape. We have an Angular panel at the end of the day, and you guys can ask them direct questions. Go to Slido, S-L-I dot D-O. There's a little box in there. The code is Angular Connect, all lowercase, all one word. Go on there and ask questions. And in the meantime, Olivier, come and tell us about Ivy. Hello, everyone. Woo so let's talk of the day. Uh, who here is using internationalization or needs internationalization? OK. Oh, a lot of people. Um, well, that's, a, that's my talk. Runtime 18N with IV. And I use IV because it's a keyword, and I wanted a lot of people to come. No, <laughs> it's going to be about IV. <laughs> uh, so. As I was preparing my talk uh, three weeks ago, actually as I was supposed to prepare my talk, and you know, procrastinating and checking Twitter and everything, uh, I saw this tweet from Minko saying that Angular IV is 92% ready, but there is still a lot of work in terms of, in term of testing documentation and I18N. And I saw that and I was like, why? Why I18N? <laughs> Damn it, I just want this shiny IV thing that everyone is talking about. And then it hits me. Wait, I'm the one working on ITN. <laughs> OK, so there ought to be something that I could do about that. So I made a PR, and I fixed it. <laughs> <laughs> so you can all thank Minko, because now IV is a little bit less ready. And uh, yeah, I, I want to be one of the first to say that uh, I'm super glad that Minko is joining the Angular team. So you can say that he's a little bit responsible for that. Internationalization. Uh, internationalization is something that a lot of people uh, don't think about until it becomes really crucial for your application. Um, if you have a company and you want to expand your business to new markets, uh, of course a lot of people understand English. And if your application is in English, your website, uh, they can understand. But if you want really to penetrate a new market, you need to have a localized version of your application. And internationalization takes time. And as most of you who need internationalization might have guessed, uh, it takes a lot of time with Angular, especially because um, it could be a lot easier to do, and it should be a lot easier to do. And that's why I was hired um, by the Angular, for, to work on, on the Angular, so that we can have better internationalization uh, support inside of the framework. So let's, let's just do a quick recap of, why IATNN, of how IATNN works today without IV. So first thing that you need to do is add the IATNN attribute on the outer element of the thing that you want to translate inside of your template. Then you add IATNN dash something attribute for the attributes that you want to translate, for example, IATNN dash title. Then you use maybe ICU expressions. A lot of people don't know what ICU expressions are. And they're actually really powerful for internationalization. This is an example. Uh, we, are, we support two types of ICU expression in Angular, plural expressions and select expressions. Plural will use a number and select will use a string. And you can um, output different text depending on the value of your vari variables. You can even use HTML inside of it or bindings or other ICU expressions. And you can go deep inside of that. <laughs> um, but yeah. Once you're done with that, uh, you should extract your text and translate. And IATNN right now only works on your templates. And whenever you're ready, you have your translation, you merge your translation, and you build your application for each language. This is how it works today. Um, we have your template and the HTML parser generate HTML nodes. And then the IoT compiler generates factories. 
And at the same time, uh, at build time, you load your translation. A serializer will uh, transform xleaf or xmb, xtb, depending on what you use, into IATNN nodes. And we will gen then merge them and replace the HTML nodes by the translations. And then your app bootstraps and your view is created. You have your application in another language, and everything is great. With IV, it's a little bit different. Uh, we moved a good part of IATNN to runtime. And so the last part is about the same. Uh, we generate uh, HTML nodes and then definitions, and that's what you use to bootstrap your application. But then when the view is created, we query the translations, and those translations can be loaded at runtime or at build time, depending on what you prefer. And then the serializer generates IATNN definitions, and the view will just grab those translations and apply them on your template when the view is created for the first time. So let's take a really simple template with a title that you want to translate and some text inside of a span. Uh, to add I internationalization, you just add the IATNN attribute and the IATNN title attribute. Uh, meaning that you want to translate everything inside of the div and also the attribute on this div. And this is uh, the code generated by uh, IV. Uh, it's a little bit different than what uh, Alex showed this morning because I use the full text version. Uh, this is what we use in, in the test for Angular, for example. So you have two parts. The first one is the creation part. The second one is the update part. And uh, the element div, you can see the div, the span, uh, text node inside of it. And the div has a title with the content header. And when the update phase runs uh, with change detections, you will have a text binding that will uh, put the text inside of the text nodes that were generated above. You can see that uh, the index of text binding matches the text node over there. So we want to remove all of the text, and we just keep the skeleton of your application, because all of the text will be replaced by your translation. So we just keep the skeleton, remove all of uh, those text elements, and then we apply the IATNN instructions for IV, and it looks like this. You will have uh, one INTN attribute uh, for all of your attributes on this div element. And then INTN start and INTN end will uh, wrap everything inside of the element that you want to translate. And we still keep the element instruction for the span because you will need it if you have, for example, queries and stuff like that. And then in the update phase, we run this instruction called IATNN exp, which will check if your binding has changed. It's similar to what uh, was used without translations. And it will uh, put a flag. And then when IATNN apply runs, we know if we need to update the content of your template or not. And IATNN apply uh, matches as the index 2 here, which matches the IATNN start above. And you can see that IATNN attribute and IATNN start have these uh, message, div, something that are passed. And they look like this. So message div is quite similar to what you had previously. Uh, you get the attribute that you want to update and, and the content, the text string. And for IATNN start, you will get this pseudo code that is what is generated by the serializer when you load your translation. And you will get, um, you can see that the number, the indexes matches what you have in your template. So uh, the index tree is a span element, and then you have the text inside of it, which is hello and a binding, binding zero in our case, uh, which will match what we, what we get in IATNN XP below. If we check them side to side. Uh, we can see that they are quite similar, except that we replace uh, all of the string parts of your application by IATNN instructions that will query uh, for the translation and then replace everything inside of your template when we get the translation. 
And this, all of this works at runtime, uh, which is quite different from what we had previously, which was replacing the text at build time. So there are a few limitations to using IATNN at runtime. Uh, you cannot change the nesting, meaning that in your translation, you can move the placeholders, like the span element, but you cannot move it outside of another element. So if you have a div with a span inside of it, you cannot move the span before the div element. And this is for queries and directives components that will use the content of your template. If we start messing around with that, then it will get really ugly. You cannot duplicate placeholders either. So if you have one span element, you can remove it in your translation, but you cannot duplicate it. And you cannot use directives or components inside of ICU expressions. Even if you can use HTML templates, uh, it will just be regular HTML. And you can use bindings, but you cannot use directives and components inside of ICU expressions. What are the benefits? Um, so one of the main benefits is that because you only need the translation when the view is created, it means that lazy loading of those translation becomes possible. And a lot of people um, think that the way we do right now, which is one build per, per language, is too complicated and uh, it requires you to change your setup, your build process, your CI and everything. Uh, it might be hard to test every, uh, also. So lazy loading the translation also means that you can uh, run your application in dev mode and have your translation work uh, without any, uh, any build step necessary for that. Um, but it also, uh, I want to stress out that if lazy loading is possible, it's not the only option. You can still load your translation at build time. So you can have one bundle for all of your languages, and then when you are bootstrapped, you need to load your translation. That's up to you uh, how you do that. And you need to have your translation ready for your application. It also means that we can finally support libraries. If you're writing a component library, and you've tried to add support for different languages, you might have seen that it was not possible to use anything from Angular for that. And now if you do a date picker or, I don't know, calendar, uh, you need to have the days translated. You can use ATN and you just need to add the ATN attribute on your component. And when uh, IV will build your library and generate the definitions, and you will ship that to NPM, um, people will just need to load that with, your trans with translations that you provide or that they write, and they will be able to use a localized version of your components. Um, there are still a few drawbacks. Um, there is a small overhead at the first template creation because we need to pass the translation in order to update the template. But this is only at the first template creation. And if you remember when we show side to side both of the uh, template generated by V with or without IATNN, uh, there is not a lot of instructions that are added for IATNN uh, compared to the original version. So there is a small overhead, but we hope that it will be minimal. And um, there is also, if you lazy load your translation, maybe some loading time depending on the solution that you decide to use. Uh, that's up to you. What's next? Because right now we focused on having feature parity with the existing Angular code, so we haven't added something that a lot of people are waiting for. And before we jump into that, I have to warn you, <laughs> everything beyond this slide is still theoretical. Uh, we will work on adding new features once IV is stable, uh, and we are sure that everything works. Runtime service. A lot of people have been requesting over and over to be able to use translation inside of their services, their components, everywhere outside of their template. And we know that uh, a lot of people use other libraries to do that right now because Angular doesn't provide this out of the box. So if you look at this template um, that we had for IV, uh, I told you that IATNN attributes and IATNN start get these strings, message div something. I didn't tell you how they would get those strings. 
Well, um, there is this piece of code at the bottom that I didn't show you. We get uh, this message div uh, from two different sources. We can either get it from Clojure, which is what we use at Google, uh, you can use this thing called IATNN service, and this is not the final name. We haven't decided on it yet. Um, don't worry, your final code will not have extra code that you don't use for Clojure or anything. If you don't use it, it will all be tree shaken away. Uh, but it also enables people outside of Google to use Clojure if they want to. So this IATNN service. Um, when you load your translation file and they go through the serializer and you get IATNN definition, this service is responsible for getting the DOS translation back. And this is exactly the same whether you're in a template or outside of a template. All you need is uh, get with some ID or something like that, you can get the translation and then you just uh, apply them to a template or you apply them inside of your code. So we worked on this design. Uh, we started working on this design with Mishko. And I asked him, uh, do you think that I can talk about any of this, even if the design is not finished? And Mishko, being all polite and everything, said, probably not. <laughs> and me, being French and not really understanding English, I said, oh, great. <laughs> but um, it's still early in, this, in the US. It's like 8 a.m. I checked on Slack, and Mishko is probably not logged at Berlin. <laughs> so if you're watching this, uh, this stream, this is the end of my talk. You can close the window now. <laughs> Great. Maybe some, some applause, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. OK, so uh, Igor isn't here, which is great as well. <laughs> Runtime service. <laughs> and remember that everything here is still theoretical. If you see something and think, well, this is not really what I want, you can still come and talk to us, and we can change this. It's not too late. So this is the list of things that we, we think are important for this runtime service. Uh, it has to be usable everywhere. So we can use it from the template, we can use it from services, components. But let's say that you build uh, an Angular element and you want to use IATN for that. And you want maybe your client to use this component as part of a library and they should be able to use IATN, uh, load the translation and everything. But then um, they might use something else. They might use React, Vue or whatever. And they should be able to use the same service for the translations. So we hope, here, we hope that we can make a service that is uh, separated from Angular and that you can use anywhere in your JS code. It has to be tree checkable, uh, meaning that if you, uh, if you don't use it somewhere in your application uh, and you only load this part of your application, then you shouldn't load this, services, this service and everything that comes with it. Uh, and it should support lazy loading, um, meaning that you should be able to load more translation as you go through your application, as you load new components. And if you decide that uh, you only need a minimal set of translation at the beginning of your application, you should be able to do that. Uh, we will be working on some tooling for the CLI that will enable uh, all of your code splitting to also work with IATNN, but we don't have more details about that right now. It should also support multiple locales. Um, if you ever try to use Angular Universal with IATNN, you might have noticed that it's even more difficult than, without, uh, than if you're only doing it for your application without server-side. So what we want to do is that this service should be able to switch from one local to another. And I can hear you over there thinking, wait, does it mean that I can change the language of my application at runtime? 
Uh, no, that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm saying that it should be able to load multiple uh, translation file and you should be able to output translation in one language. But we still have a few blocking points uh, with IV, even with IV, uh, that will prevent us from changing the language at runtime. Because when, you, when you've seen the template before, and I told you that you can delay placeholders, you can move them around, uh, if you change the language, then we have to recreate those or maybe move them somewhere else. And the view only runs the creation phase once. Uh, then everything is cached so that when you reuse those components, they are cached and really fast to, to use. So if, you, uh, if we were to change the language at runtime, it means that we would have to recreate all of your views and if you have directives, components, if you have uh, bindings or stuff like that inside of it, um, it will be difficult to keep the current state of your application and just change the content, uh, the text that you want to translate. So we've done everything that we could to make this possible. And I'm not saying that it will not be possible in, some, in the future, but we still have some work to do to, to make this a reality. But we are closer to that than we were before. And then it should be fully functional without compilation, meaning that you can use this service in your test. Uh, you can finally test your application in different languages easily. Uh, you can uh, ng-serve your application in another loc local. And you should even be able to use it without building your application uh, in AOT mode, so for JIT, for example. So this is the list of things that we want to enable inside of the runtime service. And hopefully, uh, everything will be possible. But maybe we will have something that will prevent us from doing anything, some, some of those things. So that's why I said that it was still a uh, design in process. This time, uh, this is the end. <laughs> Thank you. We have check, check, check. <laughs> okay, don't forget, you guys, we have the Angular panel asking, uh, answering questions, and you guys can ask them questions. Uh, Slido, S L I dot D O, and the code is Angular Connect, all lowercase, all one word.
Hello everyone, welcome back. Come on, are you awake? Ooh, yes. Hello. There we go. Okay, so now we have the Angular Team Q&A. Up on the screen here, you can still ask your questions on Silo, and the event code is Angular Connect. So keep the questions coming in. Um, so I think without further ado, we'll actually start with the first question. Me? Carmen. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> um, so what is the most underrated Angular feature in your opinion? <laughs> and we've had this question in front of us for five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> thing is that, the thing is that like, all of the features are, are really well received in the community. The, I, don't, I can't think of many that actually are not being used, because if they weren't really being used, either we would have been talking about them a lot already, and you'd know already, or we'd have removed them because they weren't important. I can't think of anything that's really missing, like, like missing attention. The resolver. <laughs> the resolver was shouted out from the audience. There are definitely some features that I feel like aren't used enough. I don't know if I would call them underrated. Um, one of them I think that I've been asked about before is structural directives uh, and the ability to kind of define a little DSL or micro syntax inside the expression of the binding expression of a structural directive. Um, you can do some really kind of fluent APIs with that, and I, I never see it actually used in the wild. I really like ICU expressions, and no one knows about it. And it's really a pain to integrate, so please use it, because. <laughs> <laughs> OK. So actually, I'll tell you what. Um, I just had a, a moment from listening to all of the talks and, and what's come in at Ivy. One of the really underrated uh, aspects of Angular, which is achievable but hard, is uh, lazy loading. Yeah, And I think that one of the whole points of Ivy is to try and make that more accessible to you so that you can then start to use it even more in your apps. Because at the moment, there's a very limited amount of use of it. Not because it's not a good idea, but because it just hasn't been quite so accessible. If only we had a library like OC lazy load. For Angular. <laughs> For those who don't know, OC Lazy Load was made by a fantastic developer based in Lyon. <laughs> For AngularJS. Yeah, of course. For the most important frame. <laughs> OK. Pre-2014. We ready to move on to the next question. OK. What would you rip out of Angular and do different if you had one breaking change for free? Dun, dun, dun. That's a really good question. Um, I mentioned ng modules several times already. Uh, like, I think ng module is something that if we didn't have to, we mm. wouldn't introduce. Um, but back in the days, it, there was a real need for it. And with IV and other changes in Angular over the years, we're working towards making those optional. So that would be probably at the top of my list. What I like about this question, actually, is it says, what would you do differently? And I think we would probably, the ng module, the way it works tends to be kind of confusing to newer Angular developers. And so even if we weren't to rip it out completely, I think we would probably change how it works a little bit and simplify things. Yeah. There's one thing which uh, <clears throat> I would like to rip out. And that is, uh, and that is the, the original version of ng upgrade, which we refer to as ng upgrade dynamic. Uh -huh. that, was, that was written with all the best intentions, but almost immediately we realized that it was so much better if you could AOT compile it. And so then we created a new version. But we couldn't call it ng upgrade because that would have been a breaking change. So we created ng upgrade static mm -hmm. and then had to keep ng upgrade, which we would have liked to rename to ng upgrade dynamic, but we couldn't because that would have been a breaking change. So we're now left with this situation where we have a two ng upgrade paths, which are quite similar, but different enough that you can't use them together, but similar enough that people get confused which one they should use. So that stuff, if we had thought it a little bit further ahead, then we would have skipped ng upgrade dynamic and gone straight to static. And George Kalpakas would agree with me <laughs> on the live stream. Anybody else wants to suggest some? Erin, do you have some? Uh, 
Well, I, I don't know if it would like remove it, but the one thing I always have a trouble with is zones. Uh, I keep trying to get rid of it on my own, and it would be very nice to be able to build it initially without it in the, so that all the code I've written so far continues working and I don't have to like do it again without zones. Uh, so that would be what I would try and remove, but I don't know how you'd fix it, so <laughs> I'll leave that to these two. <laughs> I, I think I have one. Um, <laughs> If I, if I could rip it out and do it somehow differently, I don't know how differently, uh, the way by which templates, CSS, and lazy modules are loaded. It's, it's kind of complicated under the hood, and I would like that to be a more visible and more easier for people to play with. OK, next question. Um, with all the developers working on Ivy, um, what will be future uh, features for version 8 and beyond? <laughs> I, I can take this one. So, <laughs> everybody, everybody's looking at me. <laughs> um, so, IV is primarily the, the top priority item for us right now, just because it's a high risk, we want to get it out of the way, and many other things are blocked on IV. Um, we already mentioned many improvements with uh, um, lazy loading with uh, internationalization, lots of improvements we have in, uh, in the works for tooling and for the CLI, but those things won't be able to launch until Ivy's done. So right now Ivy is the top priority and once Ivy is done we'll see how much time is left because we adopted time-based releases which is a really good thing for us because um, it helps us set the expectations. So we'll see how much time is left in 8 and based on that uh, we'll see what we can squeeze in. So it's kind of a follow-up question. Could you demystify the team structure behind Core Angular for parts? Is it hundreds of devs? I Is wish. it all Google? <laughs> <laughs> um, we have four, four main groups. Um, we have the framework group, which uh, is in charge of the compiler, the runtime, forms, uh, router, HTTP, and many other things. Um, we have a group that is focused on material design and the component dev kit, and then we have a group that is um, focused on tooling, on the CLI, um, and last group that is not so much relevant to this crowd, but is very much relevant to the Google uh, customers is a TypeScript uh, group of people where what they are focused on is integration of uh, the TypeScript compiler into the internal uh, build pipeline, and part of that work is also, also reused in the Basel pipeline in the CLI. But it's, it's not hundreds. Uh, <laughs> in terms of numbers, uh, I want to say if we include all the people that work in the office and remotely, I think it's about 40 people plus many awesome contributors from all over the world that help us with code reviews, uh, filing issues, or pull requests, so um, many of you. Um, next question. So if I have a page with many Angular elements, and they all have large dependencies, do they all end up bringing their own versions, and I end up with a heavy page? I can take this if you want. Um, so this is actually a choice in how you build the bundles for the elements. Um, if you are a library author publishing an Angular element and you want your element to be drop in um, onto a page, no other dependencies needed, uh, then you will probably bundle it and package up everything that it depends on, uh, including the Angular parts, and try to get that bundle as small as possible. So it's a really good incentive for you not to use big, large dependencies. Um, when you want this thing to be lightweight to load it. If you're publishing, um, if you were, for example, to take all of material and try to package them all up as Angular elements, this probably wouldn't be a good approach. What you would want to do is build a bundle that has all of the core dependencies that they're all going to use, um, including much of the Angular runtime, and then each individual element is only the code for that element in a bundle. And so you would install the runtime on the page as a script tag, and then each element that you use, you would put on the page as a script tag. So it's really up to the person packaging all of these elements to get the build working in the right way to not end up with a situation where you're shipping the same dependency many, many times. The dependency that occurred to me was RxJS. Yes. You don't want to have like 100 RxJSs on your page. <laughs> 
Cool. So is there any progress or ongoing development on the project to run Angular Runtime within a web worker? Yes. Is, am, am I the one who's... Okay. <laughs> it sucks that I get to answer all the questions. I want to share the stage with others. Um, we've done some prototype uh, with uh, Worker DOM. Worker DOM is a project that creates DOM APIs within the web worker. If anybody's worked with web workers, you know that DOM APIs are not available there. Um, our current platform web worker creates this custom abstraction that allows us to make DOM manipulation from within web worker. But there, there are some limitations, uh, and especially creating very rich uh, custom elements is, is complicated because we have to build it in a way that is web worker uh, specific. Uh, with the worker DOM approach, we, we would be in a position where we could write uh, the code just once, both for the non-web worker cases and for the web worker cases, and it, it would work. So this is the long-term approach that we are looking at, um, and we're just doing the research and trying to figure out what, what is the best direction uh, for web workers in the future. When would you recommend not using Angular? Or when would you recommend uh, using another major frame framework? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Igor. <laughs> um, yeah, Aaron can answer as well. Um, for me, it, it would be uh, not using Angular as much when it has less control over the page. So uh, y trying to sprinkle it in right now uh, is not necessarily the best use case for Angular. So if you just have you know, one, one grid on a page that you want to um, load and the rest of the page isn't just a static HTML or a jQuery-based site, um, I don't think that's a good use case. Maybe with Ivy that can change, because um, we can ship something a lot smaller. So yeah, I think there's other frameworks that are better at that right now. Yeah, and to add like some uh, more information on this, I think it comes down to what does your team value uh, in a framework. So every single framework has different advantages, and Angular has ones, and Polymer has other ones. And depending on what you want in your development experience and what you want to actually ship to the browser, uh, it's a team-specific just choice of what framework to use. Uh, so what a lot of teams end up doing is they write them all out, they write all the features, they do a side-by-side -side comparison, and then they figure out what values they want. Uh, and that's probably the best advice for what to use. And Erin would know because she has to support all of them. <laughs> Angular doesn't work with IE8, does it? Sorry? Angular doesn't work with IE8, does it? So if you have to use IE8, then there's this really good framework <laughs> called AngularJS. It's one of the major frameworks out there. Uh, that's definitely a use case for not using Angular. Sorry, I always end up doing the flippant uh, answers after a really so sensible one from Erin. I think also to some extent it's, it's an organizational decision. Like if you have a big organization that already has a lot of internal infrastructure to support solution A or solution B, um, if you come in and try to force yet another solution, unless you're ready to support it and fully integrate it into the, full, into the development cycle of the, the entire organization, it might be a lot of pain to sign up for. So you might also consider, you know, what are other projects around you using and use that as a guideline. <laughs> we lost, the we lost questions. our questions. Hold on. <laughs> I remember. I remember one. The um, what are the plans? The future plans for? Well, the question said protector, but I guess it's protractor. Oh. Protractor. Okay. Uh, protractor. We we currently. Um, what, what the things that are on the roadmap are uh, updates to the latest web driver. That there have been many changes to the web driver, and we're working on upgrading that. Um, other than that, we don't plan to make any major changes in project training this year, just because of the focus on Ivy. Um, and then next year, we have a few more things planned, but right now, we're just focusing on Ivy. So I don't expect, besides the web driver, I don't expect any changes uh, to project her this year. OK, now we've got our questions back. With the build-up hype and high expectations surrounding Ivy, do you feel it will be able to live up to the hype? 
or is it time to manage some expectations? Mm. <laughs> That's a very good question. Hmm. It better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is a huge bet for us. So it, it and we, we, we are very encouraged with the results we see so far. So I'm not sure if it's a hype, but it's, we definitely have very high expectations. We're expecting a lot from, from Ivy. Um, managing expectations, that to me comes down to the timelines. Uh, we're not going to release Ivy until it's ready. We are hoping that we can get there as soon as possible. Um, I kind of indirectly suggested that it would be in version 8. That's a goal. Um, I am not ready yet to make a commitment that it's going to be 8. If it's ready by 8, then it's going to be in 8. Um, but yeah, the timelines is the, the, probably the biggest expectation that we need to manage. You heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of um, high expectations of my own for Ivy, um, just actually working on the framework. And one thing to note is that those extend far beyond the initial release. Um, it's not just getting Ivy out the door and it makes everything magical. Ivy really unlocks a lot of potential for us to do cool things with Angular far down the roadmap. Cool. So, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Um, which dinosaur would you be, and why? <laughs> I think we'd like to hear from some people at the back. <laughs> oh God! Um, I apologize. I don't know the correct name for this dinosaur. I only remember it from. Cool at the color, if you want. <laughs> uh, well, I don't see. It's like the long neck. That's a vegetarian. <laughs> okay. Um, Stegosaurus. Diplodocus. 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 Brontosaur, <laughs> but that doesn't exist. I would be that one because I like to eat vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'd like to be the processorex, just given my uh, focus on process. I just made that up. <laughs> I'd want to be a T Rex. They have really Ooh. short arms. So then they can do really big bench press, <laughs> and I'd be awesome. <laughs> uh, there was cool. the the T Rex and Velociraptor um, sort of hybrid from Jurassic World. That would be pretty cool. Okay. <laughs> Pterodactyl, for sure. I want to fly. <laughs> Eagle. <laughs> I think it would be some kind of pink dinosaur. I, I, I don't know what name it will be, but just something, in, you know, to contrast in the green forest. <laughs> something really Stand cute. I think. <laughs> cute and fluffy, like all dinosaurs. With feathers. <laughs> Archaeopteryx, there you go. I would be the, the one that looks like a tattoo, you know, the small with the big carapace. <laughs> they, they look really cool, and I, I had one when I was a, a child. Uh, Wasn't it extinct already? <laughs> yeah, I, I had a small one. As yeah. a pet? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't say that. We are not supposed to talk about real dinosaurs. Okay. So, Noel's NX monorepo structure is elegant and feels like the approach should be fully integrated into the CLI. What do you think? <laughs> I think that's a great question. Um, OK. Like, NX does, does, does a very good job, but they, they also spend a fair bit of time maintaining that structure and uh, customizing it to make sure it works really well with all of their clients. Um, in our case, when we're trying to figure out, OK, how should we support large projects, uh, we have, for us, rather obvious example of actually doing it through Bazel because it's it's something that we already use and that we already know uh, works really well for a very big um, quantity of scenarios. So if the choice is between investing time and in trying to uh, move big projects towards Bazel, which we know will probably work for a lot of situations, or use NX that we know is fairly new because when you look at it, NX just developed their approach recently, uh, recently over the past few years. 
between that and Bazel, we kind of tend for Bazel. For us, we feel like uh, we can do more and that we can do everything that we want to do with it. Okay, next one. Has Google finished um, all the AngularJS to Angular migration projects, or how much more is there to do? I can, do you want to start? You go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, I focused on this uh, over the summer as an intern, and um, from the work that I did, I feel like I kind of scraped the surface. There's a lot more that can be done. There's a tremendous amount of AngularJS developers still de developing AngularJS out there today. Um, there's still AngularJS within Google. So um, there's definitely a lot of potential to continue doing projects. Um, we're hoping to start focusing more on like automation tools. A lot of the process could be automated, um, but it's difficult. So trying to find more APIs that are already automating part of the migration process is what we're doing right now. Yeah, and I mentioned in the, in the keynote that while there is way more active development happening with Angular than AngularJS these days, we just reached a point where we have more Angular code than AngularJS, which also suggests we still have a lot of AngularJS code at Google, and uh, there are different teams going through migrations, um, and uh, we are building some internal tooling to help with some of this. We already have some tooling to, to help with um, JavaScript to TypeScript migration. Um, a lot of this tooling is very specific to how Google uses uh, AngularJS and how we use especially JavaScript. The JavaScript is very different than the JavaScript uh, that the external community used uh, at the times of AngularJS. So some of those tools are not directly applic applicable, so it's, we cannot just take them and, and give them out to the community. But we're looking for opportunities where there are tools that we're building internally to help to help the internal teams that we could externalize. And, and once we have something uh, that we would think is useful, then we'll, we'll share it with the community. So you said Ivy unlocked some cool things far down the road map. What are these cool things? Maybe we can go around and some people can say what cool things they think are coming up. Some people we haven't heard from. Internationalization service would be really great. A lot of people are waiting for that. So being able to use translation inside of your code. Yeah, there are two that I'm excited about in particular. Um, one of them is the potential for higher order components. Uh, we have some compo uh, function that will wrap a component and change its behavior. Um, imagine you have a presentation component that displays some data that it gets as an input. Uh, you can wrap it with and create a version of that component that reads the data from NGRX store and passes it to the input, and your component doesn't have to know anything about that. That would be cool. Um, another one is the potential for templates that are not written as HTML and run through our compiler, but instead if library authors provide some other kind of abstraction that boils down to IV instructions under the hood. Um, you could imagine some cool, like, dynamic form use cases working with that. Um, so both of those I'm fairly excited for. Well, he took, a, he I took, he took the yes, two I, I wanted to share. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things that we didn't mention uh, related to Ivy is that with Ivy we now have compile um, time constants, which allows us to compile out code um, that is that we don't want to have in production, which allows us to put in instrumentation and logging into the framework. Um, this is something we currently don't have in Angular, and we would love to have. Um, and with with this feature, um, we'll be able to add integration with timelines or with just logging and give you more information about what is happening in the in the runtime. Um, and with IV, this is something that we can do and will do. So you mean useful error messages? That too, but that's a little bit separate. Uh, just logging and instrumentation is one thing. Useful error messages is a separate topic. Uh, I think, um, other than maybe some of the ones that were already mentioned, uh, the ability to start to bundle very, very small, to be able to actually use Angular to do <laughs> small widgets on a page and not feel like you're constrained by the, by the size that we ship. 
Um, so starting to be able to ship things like date pickers or you know, using, using um, Angular elements to ship really small pieces of code that can be used anywhere. Um, from, what I, from my end, what I like is that the output is much cleaner and it's more human readable compared to the current AOT compilations. Sure. <laughs> it it can make a loading lazy loading a bit less magical depending on how it's done. Uh, so since that was one of the things that I, I'd like to redo if I had the choice, that I'm excited about that. Yes. You're looking at me for next one, or <laughs> <laughs> probably shipping Angular material pre-compiled as a release output so you don't have to compile everything again and it just works out of the box and it's probably also speeds up your build process. I'm going to add mixing and matching AOT and JIT uh, compiled uh, components. So this is something that will allow you to dynamically assemble applications. I just talked to uh, some awesome guys about their application, which is fully driven using a configuration, um, and the way they do it is, is really good, but with the ability to mix and match AOT and JIT components, you will be, do, you will be able to generate components on the fly, and that will give you even more options. That's really cool. Okay, so next question is, um, so as a parent and developer, I feel a clash between family and work. Any advice on fulfilling coding potential without sacri sacrificing family time? Is this from Stephen Fluin? <laughs> says, <laughs> says Stephen down yeah, there. I was actually thinking exactly the same thing. Do we have a show of hands of who's, or, who's a parent here? Yep. It's kind of like the front row. So do we all feel a clash as well? I think inevitably there's going to be a clash, isn't there? You've got priorities in your life, and when you have responsibilities to more than one thing, you have to find a compromise between those two things. Um, and everyone has to find their own balance that works for them and their family and, and the person that we're, they're with. Personally, I'm, I'm quite lucky because um, uh, my wife's always been very supportive and I've always been the one that looks after the child, so I kind of pushed my priorities much more towards the childcare side, which I uh, really, um, really appreciated the opportunity to do that. Um, and now that the children are getting older, I'm able to then push back towards the work side, uh, which has worked really well. And, and I think the, the Angular team has been incredibly supportive to allow me to do that. I'm not sure if there are many employers or um, clients that can uh, cope with that kind of flexibility that I've been given. So I'm really, I'm really lucky. So perhaps I've been the outs sort of outside of the norm. So your advice is go work for Google? <laughs> I, I, maybe. Who knows? I, I recommend working for Google. It, look, it looks like a pretty good deal from where I can stand. Um, I think for me, uh, one of the things is just uh, segmenting the time and making sure to uh, actually set aside family time. I have four kids. Uh, so, um, you know, being at home, in the past, I, I've done the thing of work all day, work all night, work all weekend. Uh, and uh, you kind of watch your kids' lives go by. So at least setting aside something uh, has been successful for me. Making sure that like, they always have some time that's just for them um, is pretty important. And it's important for me, too. It, uh, you get burned out not doing it that way. Uh, my solution was simple. I got my son to code as well, and so we just <laughs> pair program. But on a more serious note, uh, I think it comes down to figuring out the right priorities. Um, uh, you, you know what's important to work on. More importantly, what is what is the work you will not do, right? So it comes down to figuring out your priorities and uh, work on the more important stuff. I don't have any kids. <laughs> <laughs> me neither. Not me. Mm, no. <laughs> yeah, I just stopped watching TV. Yeah. I had a lot of time suddenly. So. Yeah, yeah. And now you watch the children's programs. Yeah, yeah no, so I, when I joined, uh, when I started working for Google as a contractor, um, I, 
I'm really lucky because I can choose how many hours I want to work. So I actually work from home, meaning that I get two more hours that I don't spend in, on transportation. And I work less than before <laughs> as well. <laughs> I, I do less, yeah, like 30 hours a week, probably. Which is great because now I have more time. I can. I'm the one who, who brings my daughter to the nanny and picks her up uh, at night. So yeah. My so maybe you should just find someone who will respect that you need more time. Yeah. My my general rule is family first. Um, but you know, obviously, now I'm spending two and a half weeks in Europe without my family. So it sounds a little weird. You know, there are, there are times when. You need to make sacrifices, um, um, but in general, if you look at if you look at this long term, um, I just want to make sure that I never feel sorry that I didn't spend enough time with my kids and with my family because that would be bad. You know, if there are if there's one month in the year where I travel more, uh, okay, I can I can explain that to them and and I can deal with it. But I don't think it's something I could do um, long term and every month. So. You know, finding the right balance and finding um, people that you work with that are flexible, that understand this is important. You know, we have a large team and we all understand that everybody has a family. So if, if your child is sick or, you know, you need some more time, um, sure, you know, it, it's totally understandable. Um, but there are also sometimes, um, just before Angular Connect, there might be a lot of prep work that needs to happen. Uh, so we will probably spend more time at work than, than usual. So finding just the right balance and make sure that the expectations are clear with both your coworkers and your family really helps. Yeah, so you, what you shouldn't do is decide to redesign the entire rendering engine for your framework. Because <laughs> that takes a lot of time out from your family. Yeah? <laughs> just remember your kids grow up, so it's a limited period of your life when you can be a parent and have an active like, role in their lives. Um, no one lies on their deathbed wishing they'd spent more time at work, I think. So as much as you've got to bring in the bread and make things work at home, there are that you've got to keep a balance. Balance is the key. Um, it's this kind of rich to me. I have no kids, but I do spend a lot of time thinking about how to get the most out of my personal work time. And for me, the question to that is, you you cut no family time. You treat your work time as a finite resource and realize that maybe you get like two to three hours of awesome work a day, and the rest of it it's just less valuable. You make sure to get those two or three, and then just realize that you need the other time away from work to, to recharge and not burn out. Cool. So, are there plans to make form groups, I think that's going to be typable, generic, like form group user? I actually know exactly about this question. Um, <laughs> We had, no, I did not write it. Um, you asked the question. We, <laughs> he just we didn't had want an, to be accountable for the typo. We had an open source um, contributor named Fabian, um, who's worked with the Angular team quite a bit. Um, he helps out a lot in our Gitter channel. And he worked on a PR for this and put in a lot of the effort to make it happen. Um, unfortunately, we just ran into a blocking issue with TypeScript where uh, the the way you do this backwards compatibly, right, is you make form group have a type parameter, but the type parameter defaults to any. And there were certain edge cases in existing code where TypeScript was not picking up the default value of the type parameter, and so it would create an error in a place where there wasn't an error before. Um, and so we had to like give up on the effort because we couldn't get past that. Um, that was a while ago, though, and I haven't looked at that TypeScript bug in a while. Uh, we filed it with the TypeScript team. We should go back and check and see if we can actually land that now. Can you explain how issues are handled on GitHub? How are they prioritized? Um, so I actually gave a talk about this earlier today, uh, where we talked uh, about the process and execution, which is a very important aspect, especially as we grow as a community. Um, we are putting a lot of focus and cadence into it. That's one of the reasons I got hired into Google uh, last October. Uh, so a short of it is that we, so th there's a few things we're doing, right? So one is we, go through a triage process every single week, a couple of hours a week, we lock ourselves up in a room, go through the issues as well as the PRs and actually triage them. Triage basically means categorizing them and rationalizing them so we can focus our attention on the right priorities. So that's one thing we do. 
The second thing we also do is that um, once the issues are triaged, we actually pick the top priority issues and try to include them in our sprint plans. We run two-week sprint plans. And uh, with all the other competing priorities that we have, of course, such as Ivy, we, we try and focus on the top priority issues and get them incorporated in our sprint plan. The third thing um, we are in the process of doing, of course, there's more work left to be done, is to really enable um, a seamless contribution process for the community so you guys can actually fix bugs yourself and give back to the community, right? Uh, so I talked about that as well this morning, and uh, uh, part of that is making the process easier as well. So in terms of you know making contributions, how do we make the process easier than what it is today? Um, we are making progress. There is work uh, still left to be done, so stay tuned. So you should uh, check out our YouTube channel in the next couple of days because those talks will be uploaded. Yeah, I think uh, just one minor thing to add to that. I was talking to somebody today whose uh, issue got marked uh, fixed by Ivy. So if you're logging issues, one of the, as Manu said, we do this triage process. And one of the things that gets done with the issues is we determine um, sort of what effort it's going to take to fix it. If that issue basically just automatically goes away with Ivy, you may get this fixed by Ivy label. We'll leave it open. And it will eventually be closed when Ivy lands. But it's when you see that label, it's something that probably is really an issue. Like, we can't close it now. But we can't put the engineering effort into fixing it in Angular currently. We just, by default, get it fixed in Ivy. So there are a number of issues that are getting that um, label right now. Cool. That's good to know. So for all, what are some favorite Chrome extensions that you use and or could suggest? I have one not related to Angular or anything like that, um, but it's called Momentum. Uh, and it's basically, it takes over your new tabs. And I guess why I like it is the bottom has a quote, the middle has like your mission for the day. So you can type in like, I am going to solve this problem today. And then the side has a to-do list. So every time I open a new, new tab, I see a pretty picture, I see what I'm supposed to be focusing on, and all the tasks. Uh, you use it too? It's amazing, uh, and the pictures are so pretty. So it's like nice nature scenes and like buildings and stuff. Um, momentum, yeah. it's great. Yeah, it's great, it's great. I love GitHub Refined that Sindre Soris wrote. It adds a lot of cool features to GitHub, and I actually use that a lot. I really like Spaces. Um, the nature of my work requires me to switch context quite a lot. And with that, I have lots of tabs open all the time. Um, if Chrome team ever needs to stress test Chrome, is, <laughs> I'm probably one of the, the people that can, they can come to. Um, and one of the extensions I found that helps me manage this is uh, Spaces, where I can create a window, put, um, call it like this is a code review space. Um, and all of the tabs uh, for the code reviews that I'm working on can be opened there. And then I can close that window, uh, and the extension will uh, remember what tabs were open at what position, and I can restore the space. And so this way, I can have multiple spaces, one for each uh, context. So I can have an IV space. I can have a space for some internal work I'm working on. I can have a space for email or whatever, um, and easily close and open these without um, having too many tabs open all the time. Um, I, there's two, and I remember the name of neither. Uh, <laughs> one of them lets me like close the window or move to the next tab or whatever by making right click and then dragging down or dragging to the right or making a circle, silly things like that. And another one, which I think is way more useful, is allows you to, you know, when you need like to split your console in half, it's a similar thing that it just moves your, your current tab to another window. And it's really good when you have like setups with large screens, like I want this one to the right, this one to the left. Coordinate what I'm doing. Uh, yeah, on Angular Material, we really care about accessibility. And there's a Chrome extension called AX, just A-X-E with a capital X. It does sort of an accessibility audit of your page. And it's really useful just to do, get like an initial idea of how much work needs to be put in. Of course, you have to ch check it with a screen reader afterwards, but it's a very good starting point. Okay. Nice. Um, so if I want to bind CSS to DOM elements, 
with directives to benefit from CSS encapsulation without having a template button input. Will this be possible someday? Unless anybody wants to take this one. I actually discussed this issue with Jeremy, who's the tech lead on Angular Material. Uh, this is one of the top features on Jeremy's list uh, that he wants us to work on once IV lands. So this is this is a really good feature, uh, and it's uh, at the top of our list after IV. So you showed how IV can lazy load components, but dynamic imports are not supported by IE. How can we solve it, apart from not using IE? <laughs> Do you want to take this, or? Um, no. So, <laughs> OK. I can take it. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so our demo used um, ES dynamic import, or which is not in actually ES 2015. It's in one of the future specs. Um, but you don't actually have to use that for lazy loading. You can use system import, or you can use um, Webpack as a loader. Um, any one of those in order to uh, to fetch the bundle. Really, what the demo is about is the fact that you can take an Angular bundle that was built completely independently of the application and load it into an existing Angular context and start interacting with it and rendering components out of it. And that's something that was difficult to impossible to do before. Also, if you're using CLI, even though you authored dynamic import, uh, the build pipeline will d down level it to the appropriate uh, language polyfill. Um, in, in the case of, of CLI, we would be using Webpack APIs to do the dynamic loading. So it would still work on IE. So even though you author the, the code in the modern way, it would still run on IE if you downlevel uh, your code to ES5, which is what IE needs. Now, Jason's demo was actually built with Webpack, so it would, um, it would have worked in IE. Do you know what the impact Ivy will have on the size of some, some of your larger projects? I guess so. <laughs> we don't have solid numbers, or we don't have numbers that we feel confident sharing yet, uh, because there are, there are still issues that we need to work through. But I just I'll just say that the the results we are seeing are encouraging. Um, once we are ready to share some numbers, we will. Cool. Do you think beta will be integrated into the Angular CLI in the future, and if so, when? <laughs> Um, my answer is yes, I think that'll happen. Uh, I think that'll happen with a lot of uh, Angular Lab stickers, like a bunch of them. It's very <laughs> experimental. Uh, but I think that we're going to do it with, like we did with most things uh, in, in Angular CLI, which is we market our experimental, we iterate over it, we work over the user experience, and we make sure that uh, it works well for the overwhelming majority of cases until, and then we make it stable. Oh, um, you might see something very experimental in 7.x, but like, don't hold me to it. Uh, hold Igor to it or something. <laughs> uh, but we are like, that's the direction that we're working on. Yeah, we still have a long way to go. We'll make Bazel an option in CLI, um, and this is just a way for us to make it easier to share Bazel with uh, early access customers. We don't expect anybody to start switching to Bazel anytime soon. Uh, we still have a lot of work to do. Um, and by having an option in CLI, we'll be able to get more feedback from people, which is very valuable to us. So it's coming, but uh, unless you have one of the people that are signing up for the early access, it's probably not something that you will need to pay too much attention to. Will there be some way of server side rendering for Angular elements? There already is. <laughs> Tell us more. No. No. Um, so Angular elements are just custom elements um, that are supported by Domino. So if you're using custom, um, Domino with the right polyfills, um, there's nothing that will prevent you. In fact, um, Shopping Express, uh, one of the Google applications that we have that uses server-side rendering, um, uses uh, Angular elements in combination with uh, Universal. So from a security point of view, will Ivy provide any benefits or drawbacks? Uh, 
<laughs> uh, yes and no. Um, if you if you use the AOT mode, no. If you start doing JIT compilation in production, then you will. There, there's a potential that if you take user input and generate component templates and expressions using the user input, um, you might have uh, sec this might have security implications. So it's really if you this is just if you use JIT mode with IV in combination with AOT. Uh, and you're taking user input and directly generate expressions out of that. That might have implications, but other than that, it's business as usual. But you can use the sanitizer. Not for templates. Not for templates? I not mean, you can, but it's not what it's meant for. For, for translation, at least, uh, if you use um, runtime translations and you bind something on attributes, you can use the sanitizer. As Angular is good for enterprise development, how would you say you could help smaller projects or products who want to use Angular? Use the CLI. It's a great tool for getting you started and for moving you along and keeping your team, uh, even if it's a small team, it gives you the structure that you need. So you don't have to have necessarily a very high level architect that's going to sit down and build your webpack configuration and and set up your build and so on. I think that's the really, that's the killer for a small team. Also from Igor's um, stats on the on your first day, there's quite a lot of people using it in startups already. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I also mentioned several other options. So the um, Angular console, Stack Blitz, um, many of the easier ways to get started with Angular. Um, and with, with uh, Angular Elements and in combination with Ivy, you will also be able to use it on smaller projects where the size is important. So this is definitely something that we want to be um, more successful at. Um, enterprise applications is just one aspect that we know that we're doing really well in, but um, there's a range of other applications and, and scenarios where we would like to get better at. It was mentioned Closer Compiler uh, is used to achieve the best bundle sizes, but that there are concessions to adopt it. Is there a plan to provide an easy route? Um, on, on the CLI side, we, we considered it briefly, but uh, we already run into a lot of problems with the way we minify code and the assumptions that we take uh, and using Closer compiler, compiler and trying to make it more usable didn't seem like a great time investment at the time. So we kind of scrapped that and tried to use uh, tools that were around and that were a bit more lenient on user code. I would actually prefer to see a new generation of minifiers and optimizers appear that take the things that Closure Compiler does well without the usability and ergonomics and, and the fragility uh, issues that we, we have with Closure Compiler. So Uglyfy and Terser and you know, other options that we have out there are very approachable, but we know that we can get better results. Um, with tools like Closure, you have to give up a little too much, in my opinion, to be successful with them. So if we could find the balance between the two, that would be the best. But I think that will take a really rethinking the approach uh, to minification of, of JavaScript. And maybe somebody in this crowd is the right person to tackle that on. A minifier that uses TypeScript files as well, definition maybe. files. Maybe. How does Ivy affect to Universal? How will we do lazy load imports into Universal? Lazy loading in universal basically comes down to require statements, which are already dynamic. So this is not a, not something that you need to be concerned about. It just works. Nice easy one for you. <laughs> um, what are some common avoidable mistakes? Is in <laughs> community generated pull requests. I'll take typos. Um, so some of the common pitfalls are also, uh, thankfully, the easiest ones to avoid. 
Um, so things like you know signing a CLA, contributor licensing agreement. You see a lot of those where people don't sign it. I have a fantastic contribution to make. Um, wrong format for commit messages. We expect commit messages in a certain format. You know things arrive in the wrong format and they get kicked back. So what I would suggest is we have a document contributor.md, which is actually at the root level of the repository. Take a look at that. That gives you pointers to some of the common artifacts. Um, be really good to go through that and uh, become familiar with stuff. Um, those are top things that come to mind. Yeah, just uh, maybe two things to add to that. Um, uh, one being when you create a PR, it does run through our CI. So pay attention to the CI. Sometimes we get these pull requests, like Manu said, the commit message is wrong. Well, it just like immediately failed on CI. Uh, and, and it's very clear why. Um, sometimes you'll get into some of the tests that get run and you might not understand why they fail. Maybe a test is flaky or something. But many of the tests are not flaky. They'll just tell you right away exactly what was wrong and you can fix it. Um, that allows us to process the PR much, much quicker. And I think the other thing, uh, sometimes we get some really ambitious PRs that, you know, we, we look at these PRs and people clearly spent many, many, many hours working on a PR um, because it was a great idea to solve a problem that they had. Uh, and it, like, definitely can't be merged. And we feel bad, right? Like, why, why do we, we don't want to reject this thing. So if, if especially when it's, like, a, a larger piece of code, have, try to have a conversation, maybe open an issue, um, get some dialogue going behind it, at least, uh, if you want to try to introduce something um, relatively large or make, like, a sweeping change. Um, there's very few of those that just can kind of automatically get merged. They at least need some sort of discussion about like the architecture behind what you're trying to do. I'm going to also add, keep the pull requests as simple as possible. Sometimes we see that um, developers create a very simple bug fix, add a test, and also reformat the entire uh, the repository because uh, <laughs> for whatever reason. Those kind of PRs, they take a lot of cleanup. Uh, we often need to remove uh, changes from these PRs. So if you're working on something, try to make the PRs as focused as possible and as small as possible um, while adding the tests or any kind of required documentation. Sorry. Good, oh, good. A good way to do that is to just, when you submit the PR, go and review it yourself afterwards and look at the diff and see if you're changing something which you didn't expect. Like I think a lot of the reformatting happens when you know people have specific settings they use in their IDE and they don't really realize that as part of editing this file, the IDE has like reorganized all the imports and done other changes um, that they weren't expecting. Yeah, and you can, it, it's in the documentation somewhere. Uh, you can like run uh, yarn gulp format and it'll reformat, it'll undo the, any changes that you might have done. Um, I think one other thing though is uh, definitely write a test for the PRs. Sometimes we get PRs that don't have a test. Um, but if you don't feel that you can confidently write a test, uh, maybe the, you don't understand how to test the thing that you're trying to fix, make a comment about that with the PR. At least explain why it doesn't have a test. Maybe some other community member can help with that. Or um, you know, it's, it, it just helps us when we take a look at it. We don't just immediately reject it and say, oh, this doesn't have a test. We can't do anything with it. If you say, hey, I really want to fix this thing. I'm having trouble testing it. Um, that would help too. So we have time for two more questions. Um, are there are there plans for improved performance test tooling, and does Ivy make some of those use cases easier? I can answer part of that, but not the Ivy part. Um, and and the CLI and the tool team, we've been paying a lot of attention to the performance of our own tools. Uh, in the CLI seven, we added uh, profiling. Uh, flag to builds in so that when people upgrade and they see some kind of performance regression, it's easier for them to send us profiling information that we can take action on. Um, we've st started using a, an internal tool to, to benchmark uh, memory and CPU consumption and uh, amount of uh, processes spawned for the tools that we're using so that we have a better idea at that, like a better advance warning if these things change in the future. Uh, but the IV bit is not make up a tea. On the Ivy side of things, I think that would go um, in the category of things that we're really excited to think about in the future, um, whether we can have some kind of performance tracing integration in Ivy. Uh, and don't forget, of course, there was a talk from uh, Rangel earlier yesterday 
where they were talking about their tool augury and there was an explicit section in there which was um, a plugin for Chrome and Firefox that will make your the, the performance testing aspects of Chrome more specific to Angular. So I think that would be a really good place to start as well. Okay, and the last one is for all of you. What is the most important skill of a software developer? PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> So I think at, uh, at some point, you start working on projects that are bigger than yourself. Um, and you have to collaborate with other people. And being able to express your ideas uh, in a way that's clear and easy for them to understand and grasp, and also to listen to their ideas and maybe recognize when maybe you weren't exactly right about something, um, that kind of back and forth communication is absolutely critical. And I want to extend a little bit on the communication for that. Um, a lot of times I'm working with backends as well. So it's not just me talking to another front end engineer that knows Angular. Someone I'm, like, I'm also talking and need to communicate with the backends that are providing the data. They can create a great API, but if I have to call it 10 times, it doesn't work for us. And so having the communication across different layers in the stack uh, also helps out a lot. Um, I think two, two things that I want to, to mention are think outside of the box and challenge yourself it uh, doesn't mean that if you did always this thing right, like this, there cannot, it cannot be improved over time. So challenge yourself and think outside of the box. Maybe you can do it better next time. I, I would say, oh, sorry, I would say passion. Um, do what you like and like what you do. And if you really, uh, if you're really invested in in what you, what you're developing. You're probably gonna spend time searching for new things, new way to fix bugs, new way to um, expand new features. Uh, listening to other people talk about the things that you like will give you a lot of m good new ideas. So passion is, I think, one of the most important things that we need. If you don't like what you're what you're doing, maybe you should change and find something that you like. I think I'm going to add empathy. Uh, as developers, we often spend a lot of time just reading messages that um, other people wrote. And it's very easy for us to misinterpret information when we don't get the information um, accompanied with facial expressions. So what I often see on, on issue tracker or in code reviews is that somebody leaves a comment and other people get offended or they get aggressive just because they misunderstood the initial comment and then it turns into a totally unnecessary conflict. Um, if we give benefit of doubt um, and think about all the possible meanings of a, of a given comment, or when we are writing comment, trying to include as much context as possible, um, we can avoid these situations. And, and for, to do that, we need empathy. Um, I'd like to add one thing, and that is, uh, in addition to the how, also having an appreciation for the why would be a really good skill to have. And that comes down to the business value of why we do something. That uh, comes down to prioritization, work-life balance, and all those consequences. And that's one thing I'd really like to add. The second thing uh, to Igor's point is, we live in a virtual world, which means we work across language, you know, geographic boundaries. So having that empathy and understanding the fact that you know, people come from different backgrounds and being uh, aware of that you know, as we have our online interactions, that would go a long way. This one probably goes along with uh, what people said at the beginning, but uh, just the ability to ask questions, the ability to uh, ask a question even if you feel uncomfortable asking it. Um, and on the reverse side, um, the ability to let people ask questions and um, make, it, make them feel okay with uh, any question, whether it seems silly or not. So I think it's really important. Like That's one thing I, I've really noticed with um, you know, people at Google, there's a lot of smart people there, and they really try not to make you feel you know, out of place or stupid for asking a question. And I think that's really important. It allows people to grow. Uh, be a sponge. Absorb all of the information that you can. And going along with Jason's point of like ask those questions so you can get more information out. Um, as an intern, a lot of interns get really intimidated by their director or even their boss or just their coworkers and 
kind of like try and stick your neck out and just, I mean, most of you are interns, but you know, this applies to the general population of like, ask those questions. Don't afraid of sounding stupid or something like that. And I think it's very important to be respectful to others because in a way, so I want to uh, be more explicit here, I feel like often people have different opinions and I think it's important to also respect those opinions and discuss and see if there is an opinion that both could like, um, both agree with. So that's one of the most important things I see in open source. And unfortunately that's all we have time for. So let's hear it for the Angular team. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we're just going to wind up now. Um, but before we go, we've got some exciting prizes to hand out. Um, we've been running a Twitter competition throughout the whole thing. And if you leave now, you might miss out on your prize. But hey. Um, so here's the first tweet. It's from Bogdan, who's in the crowd here. So you can come up and collect a prize from the front. Second day of Angular Connect. I'm having a great time talking with the community. <laughs> we thought we'd bring you some classic British weather this morning. So uh, thanks to Vasilis. Hey, he's at the front as well. It's just to make you feel like it's a proper experience of being in the UK. Um, Kim Can. Uh, getting into the weeds with injector trees with Kapuna Hele and Uri Shekhead. So if you're here, if you've not left already, you can come up to the front. There you are. <laughs> Stay out of the long grass. Yeah. Felipe. I went to Angular Connect and all I got was a t-shirt, some cool ideas and a great experience. That's what we want to hear from the, that's the kind of feedback I like. And this is, um, was this the Angular Air that I forgot to mention this morning? Did anyone get up really early this morning and listen to the Angular Air at like 7 o'clock in the morning? <laughs> or actually appear on it? So this is uh, from Carniato. He's at the front as well. It's fantastic. Huge shout out to Bonster and Schwarti. And uh, I must say that Justin Schwartz, uh, Schwartz and Truber. Schwarzenberger, come on. Um, Schwarzenberger is a, my wife's old piano teacher. Um, <laughs> he got up like really early or late, uh, whatever, it was very dark wherever he was to, to run Angular Air to, this morning. So well done to him. Thank you very much for helping that. And the best tweeter gets to have the Cloud NC golden nugget that was generated by their machines. And you might have seen these on their, on their um, stand uh, this week. And, oh, as if that were, I mean, I'd be just happy with this, but in, in addition, you get a free ticket to next year's Angular Connect. Uh, woo, that's Liam Devaney. Devaney. And he's also at the front, well done. That's a Raptor for day one. There we go. That's a Raptor. So thank you very much, those are the tweets. And it's just up to Ed to say thank you to a few people. It's quite a few people. So the best way for us to do this so we, we can all finish is if you start applauding now as loud as you possibly can, I will say thank you to everybody quickly. <laughs> this is the strategy. So start. OK, right. So thank you to our sponsors. Thank you to our amazing speakers. Thank you for the team here at Excel. Thank you to Adam and the team at On Productions. Thank you to Norma and Andrew at White Coat Captioning. Thank you to Drew, our brilliant photographer. Thank you to our amazing guest host. Thank you to Andy Arkell for the mindfulness. Thank you to White October Events for organizing. And most importantly, thank you to all of you for coming along. Give yourself a huge round of applause. Thank you very, very much. We're back next year in London, the 19th and 20th of September. Save the date. Thank you so much. See you all soon. In central London. Right in the middle. <laughs> so big change next year. That's it. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>